Hey guys, welcome to the channel. As you see in the thumbnail what if Issei double dated Akino and Kuroka with his harem? Before I start, please do support for more awesome content, and subscribe my channel and like this video. Go support and follow the ex Doug Dimitomex for writing that awesome fanfic and also make sure to comment on this story. Link in the description. Let's start this video. As Issei was walking down the street, he heard yelling and what sounded like a girl in pain. Taking off into a sprint, Issei took a right down an alleyway, hopped a fence and ran into the forest that Ko was situated next to. It was known as Ko Forest, which wasn't very imaginative, but it worked. Issei kept running through the brush before he arrived at the fight that was taking place. The scene was a woman with black hair, black cat ears, two black cat tails fighting against a group of men with bat wings. There were several of them already dead, but there were still many left. At least 20 men and women went after this woman. Issei stared at the woman, his eyes wide. Someone I'm not alone. Issei was awoken from his thoughts when he heard the woman yell in pain. The woman was struck in the back by a black magical bolt, and she screamed as the magic bolt burned a large mark into her back. The kimono she was wearing was ragged. Issei looked around in fear, biting his lip as he watched the woman fight back tooth and nail, killing enemy after enemy. But she was getting hit constantly. What do I do? I, I shouldn't be here. I should be at home. I'm already out past curfew. I shouldn't be here but she's dying, he thought, as he watched the woman take a blade of darkness into her thigh, which got her to scream loudly in pain before completely destroying the man with a giant blast of purple flame. I have to help. Even if have to help, the boy swore in his head, rushing forward, stumbling a bit before getting behind the woman, his back to her back. He put out both hands, only to get struck in the stomach by a magic bolt, getting him to cry in pain. Kid! You shouldn't be here. You have to run. I'll be fine. The woman yelled, obviously lying to protect the boy. Issei closed his eyes and imagined a large shield. Bright blue electricity began to flow through his body, rolling from his shoulders down to his hands and outwards. The electricity took a more solid shape and formed a shield. The shield was larger than a human, but it was flat. It wasn't like a bubble but it served its purpose. When the magic struck the shield, the magic dissipated as if destroyed by the electricity within the shield. Issei, however, grunted when the magic struck as if it drained Issei to block the magic. Issei was bleeding from his stomach, but it wasn't fatal nor was it debilitating in terms of damage, but it hurt. Hurt a lot. Kid! Please! You don't have to die with me. I can't let you die. So I will protect you. Issei swore, his eyes glowing a bright blue before the shield expanded and sent out a shockwave in a crescent moon, attacking everything in a 180 degree area around him. When the devils were struck, they were instantly electrocuted, their bodies spasming in paralysis, which got the woman to turn the tide of the battle. Issei collapsed immediately after shooting out the electricity, passing out from the attack, but it did its job. The woman won. The woman was breathing heavily and had many cuts, burns and bruises, but she was still able to stand. She was gorgeous. She had long flowing black hair and a very large bust that was barely hidden. She was wearing a black kimono with a yellow obi. She had a set of golden beads and a very pretty headband. Her kimono had a black interior and was open at her shoulders, revealing her generous bust. The woman crouched next to Issei and gently took out his wallet, finding out his address before picking him up and carrying him like a princess. Well this kid, he used up all his energy to protect me. This human wielded some strange magic how interesting. Does he know about us so many questions but I do know I need to help him home at least. It took her half an hour to find the location but she came upon his house. It was a house on a hill. It wasn't a mansion, but it was still a house for people with money. It was a modest two-story looking house, but the large steel fence and gate proved he lived with money. She destroyed the lock on the gate, knowing she can get him another one, before opening the door. They didn't lock their doors it seemed. Upon entering, she came to the immediate conclusion that this kid was left alone in the house. There was no way that with how messy the house was, that the house was lived in by adults. Laying Issei down on the couch, she wandered to the kitchen and began to brew some tea, humming to herself. This kid risked his life to save my own maybe maybe I can hide here for a while before running again. I can at least clean his house up before I go. As a thank you, the woman said, smiling to herself. About five minutes later, she left the kitchen holding two cups of tea on a plate, only for Issei to not be on the couch. She looked around and noticed his head of hair on the other side of the couch. When she walked over, she saw something surprising. Issei had his hand placed near the wall socket, 
and there was visible electricity arcing from the socket into his hand, and she could see the small amount of bruises on his body healing up. It took him a minute but he sighed and stood up before turning. He blinked and looked at the woman. Oh, hello, he said, blushing a bit embarrassed. Here he was in front of a gorgeous and scantily clad woman. Issei was 13 after all and watched porn, but never before has he actually seen a fantasy up close. The woman placed the cups of tea onto the table and stared at him. Why? She asked, the only thing she said to him, Why? Why did you save me? I because you needed help I wanted to run. My body and mind was screaming at me to run but my heart told me that if I did I'd never forgive myself so I had to jump in. I had to even if I wouldn't do anything. I appreciate it so much. You have no idea how much I really am thankful for your help. I am glad to help. Kuroka. Don't have a last name. She said, no longer bowing and smiling at the boy who was barely a teen. What's your name? I is say hi to it's nice to meet you Kuroka. He said, looking up at her nervously. She smiled and sat down next to him, gently hugging the boy. No need to be so nervous. I am not going to hurt you. It's it's not that at all. He said, looking away and blushing. He then remembered something. Why were they chasing you? Because I had to kill someone to save my sister. Kuroka said after about two minutes of silence. Why would they chase you for that? You were only saving your sister. They they think that I'm insane that I've gone crazy with my power. I see. Well, do you have anywhere to stay? Kuroka shook her head and Issei stood up. Then it's settled. You can stay here as long as you like. Issei exclaimed. Kuroka looked up at him with wide eyes. Are you serious? Ah, yes. My parents would not be happy to have a stranger but they aren't here and they'd understand you needed help. He said, nodding nervously. Kuroka smiled brightly, staring at Issei. I of course. I thank you very much for the kindness. Don't mention it. I am just glad to finally have a friend. We we are friends right? Issei said, sitting down and staring at the cup of tea in his hands. Wait he has no friends? Kuroka thought. I of course we will be friends Issei. I am honored to be your first friend. Thank you, so the power you have. What is it? It's not magic, I'm not entirely sure. I was five when my powers emerged. I became a walking magnet. I couldn't let my parents see me. They would have looked at me like a freak and well things would be different. So I hid my powers learning to control them on my own and am still not very good. My powers aren't very strong and they are erratic. I didn't mean for my shield to explode. I at least I no longer randomly shock people or things. Kuroka crossed the table and sat down next to Issei, pulling his head to lay on her shoulder and chest, stroking his hair. You are fine the way you are. Don't think you aren't. I can help you control your power and get stronger, so you never have to worry. You can do that? Of course. I am a very strong devil after all, she said proudly, her tails swishing behind her. Issei looked over his shoulder and saw her tails. A devil? What? That's right. You have cat ears and a tail, Kuroka smiled. You are born into a world full of wonders Issei. I am? Kuroka nodded. For the next four hours, Issei and Kuroka talked about the supernatural. From devils to angels, from vampires to werewolves and from hydras to gods. She talked and Issei listened intently, asking questions every so often. Issei was a very bright young man and took everything in stride, able to handle all the information given. It seemed he wasn't surprised about what was around. In fact, he seemed happy. He wasn't alone. It was four in the morning when Issei and Kuroka went to sleep, both going into separate rooms. Several hours into the sleep, Kuroka, however, climbed into Issei's bed, snuggling into the young boy. She had fresh tear stains on her cheeks but she curled up with Issei, who nuzzled into her chest as he slept. This was the start of Issei's journey into the supernatural, and what better guide in his journey than Kuroka, his first and only friend in his life. Two years have passed since Issei rescued Kuroka from the Devil Pursuit squad that was sent after her after killing her master to protect her sister. Issei and Kuroka had grown very close to one another, but that was to be expected considering they were living by themselves in the same household. But it was more than that. Kuroka had fallen madly in love with the boy, and while she kept herself from making a true move upon the boy due to his age, it didn't stop her from attempting to get closer to Issei who was now a handsome 15-year-old teenager. He was a sophomore at Ko Academy and was top of his class in academics and physical education. He wasn't the same weakling he was two years ago. While Kuroka wasn't the easiest roommate to get along with, Issei wouldn't trade her in for anyone. She was the biggest reason for Issei's growth. Issei was weak as a child. 
He was constantly getting sick since he was a baby, and it carried up until he turned eight, when his health improved. When his health improved, they immediately went back to working their long hours, including traveling across the world. Issei didn't get to see his parents often, but still had contact with them at least one or twice a month. It didn't strike Issei that their actions were odd, considering they only left when he showed signs of improvement, as if he wouldn't relapse. It was as if they knew what was happening. It was when he was eight that he came into his powers. It wasn't as if he could shoot lightning out of his fingertips at the start, but it became obvious to him that he was different. He would become a magnet where things would begin to stick to him. Static electricity perhaps. This would happen at random, as he had no control over his power but within the year, he learned to suppress this particular part of his power, only for his power to evolve and cause more problems. He began to cause electric signal disruptions, so watching TV was almost impossible for him. Using the phone or any sort of electric device became a challenge. It wasn't a constant disruption, but imagine microwaving some food only for the microwave to shut off and come back on a few minutes later. It's an inconvenience. He was 12 when his powers seemed to have come to a standstill, no longer evolving or getting stronger. He was able to shoot lightning bolts and do other things, like making a shield out of electricity, but it never got stronger. He also did not have much control over his power, as it constantly went out of control until he ran out of power. Issei's body was a battery. It could only hold so much of a charge, that when he used up all his energy, his body would shut down or at least turn sluggish as if he was running on emergency power. But he wasn't going out of control either. His powers would not happen on their own, so it was only a lack of control of his powers that was the issue. Issei was now 15 years old and Kuroka had been irreplaceable in terms of Issei's growth. She challenged him in his studies, assisted him as well. She was the reason his grades have improved greatly since she met him, when he was still an 8th grader. He was now top of his class in all of his subjects, including physical ed. This was also due to her training him in his powers and when he turned 15, she also began to teach him the power of senjutsu. Issei was a fast learner, but his body didn't react as well to senjutsu as well as she had hoped. While he wasn't negatively affected by the power, he also didn't benefit from it as well as she hoped. He couldn't use it offensively nor defensively. The power itself shaped his body and gave him much more strength, stamina and speed. All of his physical attributes increased heavily and would continue to do so as he gotten stronger physically. So if he worked out, he gained more out of it with senjutsu. He was also able to use it to sense things and become more aware, but he couldn't use it in attacks like Kuroka could. Senjutsu also had a secondary effect on his body. It meshed well with his powers, strengthening the power within him. Kuroka had discovered more about him by studying him. She took his hair and studied his DNA, seeing that whatever was affecting him wasn't natural. It was artificially placed within him, though his body didn't necessarily reject it. The reason he was getting sick was because the power and his body were struggling to get along. But eventually, his body and power finally came to an agreement. Senjutsu was a benefit for his power because it strengthened the power itself, and also gave him an increased capacity. And like working out, if he continued training with his powers, his body would have more capacity for the power. Kuroka and Issei were really good friends. They were inseparable almost except she stayed at home almost all the time while he attended school. She was now a gorgeous adult. She was 19 years old while he was 15, giving her a four-year difference over his age. Even if the age difference wasn't that big, he was still underage and he was still human. She couldn't just yet make her move. This didn't mean she wouldn't tease him or hang all over him like they did at home. She would constantly cuddle up to the teen while he watched TV or drape over him as he studied, assisting him when she could. She slept in his bed every night after it took him a week to find out she snuck into his room. He didn't mind and welcomed it. She was a good pillow or moreover she had two good pillows for him to snuggle into. Kuroka loved Issei. She fell in love with him and never once felt this way for another. Sure, she's had other men in her life and wasn't a virgin by any means but never has she actually fallen in love like she has with the boy. Issei was a good person. He was kind, selfless, strong, sweet and would do anything for her. That's not to say she got away with everything. He would yell at her and scold her for doing bad things, like stealing. He didn't like that from her, as she shouldn't have to want for anything. He would provide for her, and she began to stop her criminal activities. Nevertheless, nothing he has done has made her hate him. He had never hit her or made her think he would hurt her. This was not to say Issei didn't have his faults. He was incredibly naive and way too trusting of others. He had came home one day in high school. He had been dating this girl for a few weeks, 
and he came home in tears. He had found out that she had been cheating on him and was only dating him as a dare from her friends. She tried to tell him she was no good when she met the teen, but Issei wouldn't have it. He put his trust into the teen. Even when Kuroko was right, she still held Issei to her, knowing that an I told you so would only hurt him more. She would just care for him as much as she could. Issei was also incredibly perverted. Not openly so, but it was very obvious that Issei had a big appreciation for the womanly body. Many a time had Kuroko snuck a peek into Issei's room, only to find him firing his flesh musket. He was also one to check Kuroko out while he thought she wasn't looking, but Kuroko always knew but it never bothered her. Kuroko was also a very big pervert, but hasn't really revealed it to anyone. Not yet anyway. Kuroko always wore revealing clothing, so if Issei wasn't looking at her, she'd be disappointed anyway. If Issei was any more open about it though, she could foresee him having issues at school, and she didn't wish that upon him. There was also many a time that Kuroka had joined Issei in the shower, only to claim she was so tired she didn't see him. Issei freaked out every time, covering his shame, but it wasn't like Kuroka hadn't seen it before but Issei wouldn't have known that. Even if he was good at using Senjutsu, she was better, and she always hid her presence. Which is also why she was never found out for living in Ko, which she knew was dangerous due to the many devils that lived in this town, including two sisters of two devil kings. She was very confident in the barriers she put over his home and land, but she was very cautious as well. She rarely left the grounds, depending on Issei, but if she did leave, she left during the day and early morning, to avoid the devils who were active mostly at night. It was four in the afternoon when Issei arrived home from school. He was a sophomore in high school and had a body that most men would kill for and most women would drool over. He was a Japanese teenage Adonis. He was wearing the school uniform with some slight modifications. His collar wasn't up, so his neck was revealed and his undershirt had a few more ons undone, revealing more of the strong chest of the teen. The jacket was rarely zipped up and he had the imagery of a delinquent, but with Issei's demeanor and actions, no one considered him as a bad person. If anything, women were always trying to get close to him but ever since the woman that cheated on him and broke his heart, Issei was never available for anyone. This had worried Kuroka as she had studied him, but she wasn't going to let it stop her. When he came of proper age, there was nothing that he could do. She was his. She shall have a litter of kittens with Issei, mark her words. Issei had learned everything about the supernatural that Kuroka had on her mind, including the fact she was a Nekashu. A yokai but a very powerful breed. There were very few of her kind left, so she made it clear she wanted to help bring the Nekashu race back. Issei didn't have a response right away when hearing that, being embarrassed but she didn't directly say to him she wanted children with him. So, he told her after half a minute that he really hopes she can fulfill her dream and that he thinks she would be an amazing mother. Issei entered the house and kicked his shoes off into the corner next to the door, only to stumble forward as a black blur launched herself and hopped onto his back. He grunted a bit and looked over his left shoulder, where he would see Kuroka placing her chin on his shoulder, rubbing her cheek against his own. Welcome home Issei, Naya. Would you like dinner now a bath or how? About. Me? Naya. She giggled, her tail swishing back and forth. Issei sighed and gently scratched behind Kuroka's left ear, getting of appreciation from the black kitty. I'll take you anytime. He said with a smile, carrying his best friend off with him as they entered the living room where he tossed her over his shoulder and onto the couch. You still enjoy sneaking up on me? He laughed a bit. It's not my fault you get so engrossed in your music that you don't hear me coming, Naya. She said, looking up at him playfully. I don't have a reason not to listen to my music. I know that you won't harm me and that no one else can sneak up on me. Kuroka giggled and sat up from her seductive pose, slinking off into the kitchen. Kuroka had taken up a maid-like attitude while she lived with Issei. Issei wasn't a very messy person so it wasn't hard work. But Kuroka still felt like she needed to do something for Issei and this was the very least of what she could do. She came back with a bowl of frozen fruit, which was defrosting. She placed a cup of ice water on the table and placed it with the bowl. It was Issei's snack before he cooked dinner. Issei was working hard to become a chef so he had a job on the weekend where he helped in the kitchen of a Japanese steakhouse. He was an intern to the head chef there, and this was valuable experience for later. Thanks Kuroka. I don't know what my life would have been like if I didn't meet you. Quieter no doubt, Naya? Issei nodded. You are a very loud cat, but I don't complain. I wouldn't trade my life for any other. I'm happy to have you here with me. Flattery will get you nowhere you know, Naya. She said with amusement in her eyes and tone, Issei rolled his eyes. 
Kuroko was a big flirt, and Issei was the one she flirted with. But to Issei, it seemed just silliness so Issei would flirt back. Unknown to him, Kuroka truly wanted to be with him. But it wasn't right just yet. Kuroka took a seat on Issei's lap. Her legs off on the other side of his lap where she sat on his right leg, curling up to him. They cuddled like this often. It was right then and there that the front door opened and Issei looked up, his eyes wide as he spotted a man. Dad! He exclaimed, standing up and basically, tossing Kuroka off of him as he tried to hide the fact he had a woman in the house. Issei's father stepped into the house, staring at the two of them before he removed his shoes. He said nothing and his face was impassive, but he walked up towards Issei and stared down at his own. Issei's father was known as Cyrus Hayadu. Cyrus was half American and half Japanese. Cyrus's father was American who fell in love with a Japanese woman during WW2, hence Cyrus's half American looks in the name, who was named after his father. Dad, it wasn't what it looked like, Issei said fearful. His father was a very strict man, at least Issei thought so. Issei feared for himself, but he mainly feared for Kuroka's sake. As if it was a comedy show, Cyrus instantly had a smile on his face and leaned forward. Oh, so my son is still a virgin, huh? A pity, you had a pretty young woman in your lap and you didn't make a move. Oh son, you have so much to learn. He said, slapping his son on his back before hugging Issei tight. Issei looked really confused as he hugged his father, staring into the man's chest. When they removed their embrace, Issei stared up at his father in confusion. You aren't mad? At first I was concerned, but the house isn't up in smoke, the house is as clean as I left it, and you seem to be happy. Not to mention you look much more healthy than when I last saw you. You were 12 when I last visited. Yeah I've improved my life. I can see that. I heard great things from your teachers actually. You are a top student, and you have a job at a very nice restaurant. There's no reason for me to get unhappy with you having a life. You are a growing boy after all. It's not what you think. Kuroka and I aren't dating or anything. We're just friends. Kuroka huh? He said out loud turning to the 19-year-old woman who was caught with her ears and tail out. She was staring at him suspiciously. It was then she was pulled into a hug by Issei's father. So you're the woman who has kept my son happy. I am glad to have a daughter-in-law, he said with boisterous laughter. He put the woman down and smiled happily. It was then Issei stared at Kuroka with eyes wide. Daddy you aren't concerned about Kuroka? You mean the cat ears and tail? She's an Ikomata right? How would you know that? Kuroka asked, staring at the man with seriousness in her eyes. Oh don't look at me like that. I'm well aware of what the supernatural is. How? Issei asked. I can tell you all about it over dinner. So, what are we having? It's pizza night. Issei said. I have already ordered it, and it should be here shortly. Wonderful. The older man said. Cyrus was a heavily built man with many scars along his face and arms. Cyrus was a military contractor. He was ex-American Special Forces. He was a mercenary now and did private jobs. About half an hour later Issei, Kuroka and Cyrus were sitting at the table, enjoying their meal. Cyrus and Issei looked a lot alike, except Cyrus was much taller and beefier. Cyrus also had brown eyes and brown hair, while Issei had blue eyes and black hair. So, how did you two meet? Cyrus asked, munching on a piece of sausage pizza. She she was being chased by devils who were trying to kill her. Issei said. Cyrus nodded. How do you know of the supernatural? I've summoned devils before and I work with scientists within heaven and the underworld. You don't look like a scientist. Looks are deceiving. He told Kuroka. You're the one who gave Issei his powers and left him when his body got better. Issei turned to his father who put his pizza down and sighed. Yeah it was me and my wife. He said pulling on his collar. Why Issei asked clenching his fists. Cyrus sighed and took a drink from his beer bottle before nodding. It was an accident. Your mother and I were working on an experimental weapon. We took it home to do some final work before presenting it to our employers when you found the weapon and somehow activated it. We didn't have time to get you away, so we sealed ourselves in the panic room when the weapon went off. As soon as it was safe, we came out. The weapon was to give people powers. We were employed by the fallen angels who wanted to bolster their forces with stronger warriors, so we came up with the weapon. It worked but when we saw what happened to you, we cancelled the project and returned all the money they gave us. Issei, we never meant to make your life harder but it's irreversible. Issei nodded and looked at his fingers, letting some electricity arc between his fingers. I'm not angry if it wasn't for what happened, I'd never have saved Kuroka. 
I am glad you are so forgiving and your mother would love to hear it God rest her soul. He said, which Issei and Cyrus bowed their heads in silence. After a half hour of eating in silence, Cyrus was pacing around the living room in silence as Kuroka and Issei handled the dishes. After 10 minutes of cleaning up, the two friends came into the living room to see Issei's father pacing nervously. Dad? Oh I was wondering Issei. You seem to have gotten stronger, and it's no doubt Kuroka here has helped you so why? Why did you get stronger? To protect Kuroka and everything that means something to me. I want to protect what I hold dear. Cyrus smiled and nodded. How would you like to train with your old man? In what? Physical combat, and we can work out together. You can use some martial arts training I would think. Issei looked at Kuroka who shrugged. Go ahead. Kuroka said and Issei nodded. Wonderful. Then let us head out back and we can get started. Four months passed since Issei's father returned to live with Issei. During that time, Issei went under heavy martial arts and physical training, as well as getting him more used to violence. Desensitization basically. He was training Issei to not be afraid of fighting as Cyrus and Kuroka both explained to him that the supernatural was very violent, just like humans. His training also helped him evolve a bit more in his electricity manipulation, so Issei learned some new techniques. It was now winter in Japan. Snow wasn't too common, but there was a slightly frosting on the ground, which made the area much more beautiful than it usually was. Issei was currently shoveling the small amount of snow off of the driveway and path up to his front door, just so no one slipped on his property. As he was shoveling snow, Cyrus came out the front door and stood on the porch, looking at Issei who was shoveling snow in silence. Hey Issei, I'm going to have to leave you again. I have a contract to handle in Africa. You okay with that? Of course. I can take care of myself and I know that you aren't leaving because you want to. You have a job to do. Cyrus smiled and chuckled a bit. Plus you aren't alone. You got that hot girlfriend of yours. She's not my girlfriend. Issei said the 15 year old teen blushing. Cyrus grinned. He enjoyed teasing his son. Either way, you're not alone. You understand that having her around will one day backfire you will be dragged into the supernatural world. I was dragged into it when I saved her dad do you want me to tell her to leave? No. I want you to do what you think is right. If you want to keep harboring her, I have no issue with that. I just wanted to remind you to keep on training as your peace won't last for long sadly. It never does. He said with a sigh. I won't stop my training just because you leave. I'll practice what I was taught and I will train with Kuroka more. I. I want to protect her, Cyrus smiled and nodded, giving Issei a hug who reciprocated it. The two men embraced for a bit longer before Cyrus pulled away, putting his bag into the truck. Stay safe Issei, you too dad, Issei said before Cyrus gave him a small smile and drove off, once again leaving Issei at the mercy of the flirty cat. Kuroka had been listening in on their goodbye and the cat blushed as he heard that Issei wanted to protect her despite the fact she was much stronger than he was. It really showed she made a good choice in who would be the father of her children. With Cyrus staying in the house, Kuroka dressed less provocatively, not wanting to embarrass Issei in front of his father, nor give his father the wrong impression. After about two minutes of Issei staring into the distance as he watched his father's car disappear from sight, he was once again tackled from behind as Kuroka hopped onto his back, her arms around his neck as she laid her head on his left shoulder. Naya, you shouldn't be so disappointed. He'll come back. She said, giving his left cheek a lick. I guess I expected my father to stay with me forever. I forgot that he rarely ever came around. He said, sighing, as he held her legs to him, letting her ride him. He'll be fine. He still talks to you every week on the phone, Naya. She said, rubbing her cheek against his own. I'm not worried about him. He's unkillable. He said with a smile. It's just a reminder of how alone I was until I met you. He said taking Kuroka back into the house with him, before tossing her on the couch. She let out a small yelp, even though this was just a common ritual for them. Issei crawled onto the couch and laid his head on her lap, cuddling up to his best friend as they began to watch TV, the cat stroking the hair of the boy she fell in love with. A month had passed since Issei's father left for work. The household settled back into normalcy, with Kuroka subtly flirting with Issei, showing off a lot of skin and joining him in the shower a few times a month apologizing cause she was so sleepy. Of course, Issei never kicked her out, but he would always avert his eyes from her body and hide his shame. Kuroka continued to spy on him, longing to be with Issei but it just wasn't right just yet. But as soon as it was time Issei would learn what it's like to be mated with a cat who has longed for a man for many years. Issei was walking home from school when he decided to take a different route home. 
He wanted to get something special to eat for a snack and there was a new shop opening up in town. It was a candy shop and he heard around school about how amazing the chocolate bars that were made in the shop was. The shop was located in an old factory that had been bought out by an American company, who set up a tiny shop right outside. They actually built on the factory to make a small shop while the factory made their chocolate. Issei had a large bag filled with bars upon bars of chocolate. Dark chocolate, milk chocolate, chocolate with caramel, chocolate with peanutter, dark chocolate with peanutter. He went on a huge shopping spree, as he could freeze or refrigerate the chocolate. It was always good to buy in bulk when offered, if you had the space to do it. With a chocolate in his hand, Issei was walking along the sidewalk. Up ahead was the shrine. He's never been up there before and had always been curious. But the shrine was on the other side of town, and it was a much longer path home from school. Issei had been curious because he heard a horror story that a monster lived up there. A black-haired woman with a whip would take men off the streets and punish them, and if you listened closely, you could hear the pained cry of a man being whipped. Issei was curious if the stories were true ever since he was a child. So when he arrived at the stairs that led up the hill to the shrine, Issei stopped at them and took a moment to think before walking up them. Halfway up the stairs, Issei's enhanced hearing picked up something. It was the cries of a child, a little younger than him, and the screams of an older woman. Issei instantly began to run up the stairs, though he tripped over a couple of them as he scrambled up them. Issei was terrified, as even though his father taught him to be less afraid of violence, Issei was still a child and this was his second fight he would ever be in, if his fears were correct. It took him about a minute to get up the massive amount of stairs and he ran into the house, only to come upon his worst fears. The woman he heard scream, was dead and what Issei assumed was her daughter, was crying underneath the body of her mother, who died protecting her. There were five men, though only four of them were alive as the fifth one laid at the feet of the mother. Each of them had black wings, that looked like a bird's wings. Issei immediately knew they were of the supernatural, and from what he was taught by Kuroka, they were fallen angels. Issei's presence was unnoticed so he ran into the fray, immediately sliding underneath the man who raised a spear at the child, kicking his legs out from under him. Issei then turned to his left on a dime, before using his electricity, shooting out a large barrel-shaped charge of electricity, knocking back three fallen angels deeper into the home, sending them through walls and windows. It was a shockwave attack. To his right was a fallen angel who turned to him. Why you little brat? The man said, aiming his spear towards Issei would reached over, moving to the left of the arm, before pushing on the arm. The arm moved and the spear was driven into the stomach of the fallen angel that Issei had tripped, which got the fallen angel to scream in pain. He wasn't dead but debilitated. This all happened within a five second time frame. Issei noticed that the other fallen angels were coming back into the house, and the one that tried to kill him was pulling his arm away to kill Issei with another spear stab. Issei electrified his arms and hands, juicing them up for physical attacks. He quickly lifted the arm of the fallen angel who tried to kill him, lifting the spear out of the way, before sending out a palm uppercut into the fallen angel's jaw, knocking the fallen angel back who fell back onto his back. Issei moved forward from his position, and dodged to the left once more of the third fallen angel who was the first to arrive back in the house. With that motion complete, Issei reached underneath the fallen angel's spear arm and grabbed onto his throat and pushed him back into the fourth fallen angel. They both stumbled to the ground. The fifth fallen angel came from the sky, and Issei smiled. He knew exactly what to do here. He put his right arm out and flung out a bolt of electricity to a nearby fire extinguisher and flung it out and into the flying fallen angel who was dive-bombing at Issei, which sent the fallen angel tumbling. The fallen angel tumbled right on top of the two fallen angels who Issei had pushed into one another, and ended up crashing them back onto the ground. Issei heard something behind him and when he turned, he let out a scream of pain as a spear of light grazed his side and under his arm, spraying a mist of blood across the wall. Issei roared in pain and fury, before he ducked under the next spear and sending his electrified elbow into the solar plexus of the fallen angel. With the fallen angel doubled over, Issei grabbed the back of his head, and drove his knee right up into the nose of the fallen angel. Grabbing onto the shoulders of the man, he tossed him into the other three angels who were getting up from the attack, once again sending them into a tangled mess of bodies. The fifth fallen angel finally stood up. This was the one that was stabbed in the belly. He spat blood onto the ground and caught Issei off guard with a right hook. The punch from this fallen angel stumbled Issei back and jumbled his vision, before delivering a left hook into Issei's cut followed by a sweep of the legs. Issei was sent to the ground, his body aching and his breath knocked out. The fallen angel grinned and stood over Issei, forming a light spear, 
Issei coughed out blood but not before he shot out a line of electricity and grabbed onto a metal pipe that was sticking out of the wall. He ripped the pipe out and impaled the fallen angel in the gut, a bit above where the light spear penetrated his stomach. Issei vomited blood and bile onto the ground as he tried to stand up, his body aching as he stumbled. Seeing three of the fallen angels beginning to move, Issei had to act fast and he steeled his stomach as much as he could. Shooting out two bolts, he grabbed two more pipes and basically huddled all five fallen angels between two pipes and bent the pipes to entrap them. Issei felt his reserves of electricity run very low but the shrine had no electricity around, so he couldn't recharge. With another vomit of blood, Issei summoned the rest of his power and grabbed onto the pipes. He sent the electricity through the pipes, effectively electrocuting the five fallen angels. The fallen angels would scream in pain for a few seconds before the massive amount of voltage and currents that Issei delivered stopped their brain completely, knocking them unconscious and killing them rather quick. It wasn't a slow death, but it was painful for a few seconds. Their eyeballs melted out of their sockets and as soon as Issei saw this, he pulled away and collapsed to the ground, crawling away before his body shut down, sending him to pass out from the lack of energy in his body. He would be alright because bodies produce natural electricity and it would recharge his body enough to wake him up in about 10 minutes. When Issei awoke, he found himself outside of the shrine. From the pain in his back, he figured he was dragged out, but that was found out later. His first thing he saw when he awoke was the face of the girl he saved. She was stroking his hair, tears in her eyes and on her face. And when she saw he awoke she immediately hugged his head. T thank you so much. She sobbed out. Issei didn't say anything except gently pet her head and her hair. He said nothing but let her cry over him. I'm sorry he said after five minutes. His voice was quiet and she could tell he was truly sorry about something. W what for? She asked, sniffling. I wasn't fast enough to save her eye. I wasn't strong enough. She laughed a bit, though with the snot in her nose and mouth due to the crying, it sounded strange. She then hugged his head. It wasn't your fault my mother died protecting me and if she didn't I wouldn't be here. Still Issei said quietly. Before she could reply, a light appeared and a man stepped out of it, appearing. Akino! The man exclaimed. Akino looked up from Issei and her eyes widened. She looked at her father with fear, disgust and anger. The man walked forward and tried to touch Akino's shoulder but she pulled away, dragging Issei with her, scraping his back more. Stay away from me. What? Those men they killed mother. All because of you. You. You stay away from me. From us. I don't want you anymore. You killed mother and you weren't around to protect us, she said tears flowing from her cheeks. Akino I. No. I don't want to hear any excuses from you. Stay away from me and get out of my life. You're no father of mine, she said turning her back to her father. The man frowned and immediately backed up, staring down at the child she had in her lap. The child was injured and from the smell from the shrine and the boy, the boy was the one who protected his daughter and saved her life. He hoped this boy would keep his daughter safe and happy. The man disappeared in a flash of light, letting Akino sob with her forehead against Issei soaking his face and hair with her tears. He didn't really like this, but he wouldn't move cause he also didn't like her sad. He would let her cry and he would be there for he. It was a few hours before Issei arrived back home after saving Akino from the fallen angels. Akino was fast asleep on Issei's back, who carried her the entire way. As soon as he entered the house, Kuroka went right for him like a bullet only to slide on the wooden tile after seeing what Issei was carrying. Or should it be who he was carrying? Kuroka stared at Issei for a moment before helping Issei unload his cargo onto the couch. She placed a small blanket on Akino before she dragged Issei away and into the kitchen. Spill. She said, her demeanor serious. She had her arms crossed. Well I ended up killing a bunch of fallen angels to save her. Issei said. It took him about five seconds before his eyes widened flashes of the fight appearing before his very eyes. He collapsed to the ground onto his and stared in horror at his hands. I, I killed. Kuroka was instantly cuddling Issei to her, holding him tightly to the flesh of her. She wasn't topless, but she always showed generous amounts of cleavage and her were massive so it was very generous. Issei did not cry. Issei did nothing but stare in horror at his hands. Kuroka placed her chin on top of his head, holding him close to her. Issei finally learned what it was like to be part of the supernatural. Where killing is a common thing. She has killed many and now Issei was acting like she did when she was a kid. She was much younger when she spilled blood. Issei you saved a life. An innocent life. It is better to kill many guilty men in order to save one innocent person's life. 
This is what your father was worried about with you East say you did nothing wrong. I killed without even thinking I I just did it. I got them right in a trap of metal. And I electrocuted them all. I didn't even stop I did it until I was sure they were dead. I didn't even think. What am I? I'm I'm just a kid. I, what is wrong with me? Kuroka instantly pushed Issei off of her and forced him to face her. There is nothing wrong with you Issei. Nothing. It's what's wrong with the world. As if Issei was ignoring her, Issei began to sob, his hands stained with blood metaphorically. His hands were clean technically. Kuroka decided to just hold him and hold him she did. They would stay like this for a few hours. It was around 8 in the evening when Akino awoke. When she awoke, she let out a scream of fear, looking around the unfamiliar house. Kuroka exited the kitchen, alone, and this freaked Akino out even more. Are you here to kill me too? Naya, are you always so loud? Kuroka said, rubbing her cat's ears in irritation. Naya, I have no interest in killing you. It was Issei who saved you anyway. Issei that's his name? Naya, that's what I just said isn't it? Kuroka asked, her tails swishing. You have a tail? Naya, I'm a Nekashu. Nice to meet you. I'm Kuroka. Akino W where am I? You're in the house of Issei, Naya. Where is he? Akino asked. This got Kuroka to stop smiling and her tail stopped swishing. She got serious. He's asleep in his room. He's he's only human and he just took his first life. Kuroka said. She looked at Akino for a moment. Akino looked almost like Issei's age. He saved my life if he didn't come and kill them I'd be dead. That is what I told him. Kuroka replied. Issei, however, is only human and this was the first time he took a life. I see. Akino said with a frown, looking around his house. Will he be okay? Yeah. He just needs time to process things. He should be fine in a few days. So, what do you plan on doing now? She asked, Kuroka still serious. I dunno. I lost my mother she asked. What about your father? I have no father. That man is not my father. All right, all right, Chish. Stepped on a landmine there. So, what do you want? Can I stay with Issei? Kuroka shrugged. That's up to him, but he'll say yes. He's too good of a man to kick someone out. Akino giggled. Yeah, I can see why you like him so much. My heart fluttered when I saw him come to my rescue too. Kuroka huffed. Great. So it looks like this human is going to get a harem the way it's going, Naya. Kuroka said. Her words sounded like she was upset, but her tone was playful. She didn't mind at all it seemed, probably. The teenage fallen angel said with a smile. A few days passed since Akino was saved by Issei. Issei had locked himself in his room, not leaving for anything. Not even school, which he had missed two days of. Kuroka had opened his door and gave him a plate of food, only to leave to leave Issei to his thoughts. Issei had a bathroom in his room, including a shower and shower he did. He showered quite often, probably cause it's where most men do their thinking. Issei refused to talk to anyone and no one could get him to open up. Akino's schooling went along well. She didn't attend the same school as Issei as the school he went to didn't go coed until next year. She was a year younger than Issei, being 14 but she was in the same grade. Apparently she started school earlier than other kids, so she was younger than them but never skipped a grade. It was a Tuesday morning when Issei came out of his room, slowly coming down the stairs. Akino was at the table eating breakfast, wearing the school uniform when she saw him and her eyes never left his form as he walked into the kitchen, standing in the doorway looking at Akino as well. Hi Issei. Akino said, hoping she didn't scare him off. Hey Akino. Issei said after a minute of silence, giving her a small smile. How are you feeling? The fallen angel teen asked. I'm on doing okay. He said, and as soon as he said that, he was tackled from behind, though he didn't fall. He just stumbled forward. Once again, a black bullet struck him from behind and clinged to him. Naya, you're awake. I was worried about you. So mean Issei, making me worry about you, Naya. Sorry Kuroka. I had to take some time to think about things. Naya, and what have you decided on? That I will do what I must in order to save the people that means something to me. Issei said, smiling. Does that include me? Akino asked. Yes. It does. Even if I don't know you, you're now part of my family, and that means you mean something to me. Issei said with a big smile. Akino blushed and looked at her food. Akino had developed a crush on the guy. Issei took a seat and had himself a bowl of cereal as well as an apple with peanutter. With a smile, Kuroka joined Issei and Akino, having herself some eggs and bacon. 
Akino was having a bowl of oatmeal and a banana. They ate in silence, enjoying their meal before Issei and Akino would head off to school together. The schools weren't too far apart so they could travel about half of the way to Issei's school together before Akino would go to her own. Ten minutes later, the two teens were on the road, heading to school. Akino quickly grabbed Issei's arm and held it to her, cuddling up to the boy as they walked. Issei thank you for saving me. I am really happy to have met you. I feel the same way. I am glad to have met you. Can I stay with you forever? For as long as you want. Issei said with a big smile. The two teens walked in silence from there on out. Akino and Issei were to be friends forever, just like Kuroka and Issei. Unknown to Issei, both women had crushes on him while in Kuroka's case, she loved him. Issei had feelings for Kuroka as well, but never admitted it. He didn't know if she truly loved him, or was she just being playfully flirty like he's seen on TV shows. He didn't know, but he didn't want to ask her because he didn't want to ruin what they had. She was a precious friend and now Akino, would be another precious friend in time. Two years passed since Issei rescued Akino. The fallen angel had lived with Issei ever since then, and continued to this day. Kuroka was very warm and receiving to the new member of their misfit family. They got along very well, almost too well. It wasn't uncommon for Akino to flirt and be playful with Issei, often at the same time Kuroka was. Issei, many a night, had to take cold showers in order to relieve the pressure that built up from the constant attention from the women. As if Kuroka was training Akino, Akino began to imitate Kuroka in many ways. She would jump onto Issei's back consistently, laying her head on his shoulder and forcing the male to carry her around. Just like Kuroka had done ever since she and Issei began living together when he was 13. Akino and Kuroka also shared Issei's bed and many a time had the two women seen the glory of the Adududu when they awoke. This embarrassed the poor teen many a time, that he would purposely wake up earlier than the females in order to hide the alarm. Life with the females was hard, especially considering how amorous the two were to him. With the addition of Akino's attitude towards him, Issei wondered if maybe he was wrong about Kuroka and she truly did want him to be with her. But not wanting to ruin the current status of their relationship, Issei wrote off Akino as just imitating Kuroka at his expense. The two females got along very well and spent a lot of time together at home while Issei was studying. Akino was smart, but Issei was in higher grade classes. He was in college prep classes all throughout high school, and was actually taking more college level classes than high school. So he was getting college credit, and wouldn't have to spend long at the University in Co. The school that Issei attended, however, had decided to send him to his sister's school, which was becoming co-ed come the next school period, which would be his senior year. So, Akino would now be attending school with Issei. Akino and Issei had talks about the day that he saved her, but it took Akino a while to ask about it. She learned that Issei, while human, held powers that were an accident by his parents. At first, Akino was angry at his parents only to learn it wasn't their fault and they loved him nonetheless. Akino decided to trust Issei with that. Issei also learned that Akino was a fallen angel and helped her through her problems even going so far as to make her not hate her fallen angel heritage. Unknown to Issei, this only cemented Akino's feelings towards Issei and she, like Kuroka, loved the man. They wanted him, but wouldn't make a move yet. Akino could make a move due to their age, but Kuroka had first claim over him so Akino would wait. Plus, wasn't it hot to have an affair? Well Akino thought so. Issei was now a 17-year-old teenager. His body had a gross spurt last year. Finally coming from his short years as a 5 foot teen, he now was a tall 6 foot 3 and his body also got wider. His shoulders broadened and his chest did the same. Issei never stopped working out and getting stronger, so his body was even better looking than before as his abs were more pronounced with his new size. In terms of his strength and martial arts prowess, Issei had grown significantly. Senjutsu and his own powers, however, were a different case. Senjutsu still wasn't his strong suit only learning a few magic spells, but others were almost impossible for him to grasp. Kuroka assumed that with his own powers, it messed with the Senjutsu to properly form the spells. That being said, Senjutsu did come in handy as now Issei learned how to channel his ki and use Tuki. This severely increased the powers of his muscles, as Issei redirected the Tuki to be inside of his body instead of outside, which was the normal way of using Tuki. When Kuroka discovered he did this, she freaked out on him and began to yell and scream at him scolding him for doing something so reckless. She explained to him that it wasn't natural and the last couple people who did that died upon attempting it. Seeing that Issei was fine, she ended up not scolding him and telling him to be more careful. She told him that she didn't want him to die on her, 
and that she wouldn't know what to do if he was gone. This prompted a cuddling session as Issei consoled the kitty. His powers, however, hadn't improved since he saved Akino. He tried hard to improve, but he couldn't figure out a way to increase how much energy he could store in his body and no new techniques surfaced. This prompted Issei to quit last year in trying, though Kuroka urged him to continue but Issei never did. Issei was stumped and got discouraged. Kuroka wondered that the reason why he couldn't develop any more techniques is because he wasn't getting stronger in that regard, so no new techniques would surface. But she wasn't sure how to get him to become stronger. She, nor him, understood how his power worked really. It was the first day of school and all three members of Issei's household was downstairs eating breakfast. Akino was eating oatmeal and a banana. Issei a bowl of cereal and an apple while Kuroka ate eggs with bacon. It was the normal breakfast for them. Issei had crafted a lunch for Akino and himself, so they could eat lunches without having to buy them at the cafeteria. They were expensive after all. Naya, it felt like just yesterday you guys finished school. The break didn't last long. Kuroka whined. I know what you mean, but it's just one more year and I will have more free time. College won't last as long as high school and I won't have many classes to take. Akino looked over at Issei. Why not? Wouldn't they just make you take the same amount of classes so you graduate earlier? I opted for this course. I want more free time to get better at what I want to do in the future. A chef, right? Akino asked. Yes. Issei said smiling. I love to cook. Naya, well, if you are ever hungry, I can always feed you Issei. I have a nine-star meal waiting for you. She said, winking at him. Issei stared at her with a dull expression. Cute Kuroka. Let's just talk about such subjects while we are eating. Akino leaned over to Issei and grinned. What? Didn't you hear that what we offer is known as the meal of champions? You can have it anytime you want breakfast, lunch, dinner, and dessert. She teased. Issei rubbed the bridge of his nose. How did he get surrounded by such foul-mouthed women? Issei, however, was grinning inside. Oh, you know you want to take them up on their offer. Devour their bodies as a nine-course meal. Come on. Just take their offer. They want you too. Otherwise, why tell you about it? His heart told him. His brain, however, spoke up. They don't like you. If they wanted you, they'd have told you that they loved you and wanted you. No, they only tease because they are vixens. Women who get off on teasing men. They are your friends but they don't want anything more. Don't get yourself hurt by trying to make something out of this when it's clear it's not. Issei's heart and brain would argue like that back and forth with each other. An inner turmoil within Issei really. He loved the two women in his life, but he was a coward. He truly was. He couldn't ruin what they had, and even though he wanted them he was too much of a chicken to find out if they truly wanted him. How could anyone want him, especially to babes who were supernatural? A devil and a fallen angel. How could they want a human? Why would they? Issei's inner battle within himself was shaken when the sound of the sink turned on. Kuroka was washing off her dish and then Akino did her own. Seeing that Issei didn't finish his meal, Kuroka frowned at Issei. Naya, not hungry? Yeah. Sorry. You made my food for me and I couldn't even finish it. I'll just take a banana for a snack later. Neither woman believed him, but they didn't call him out on it. Naya, it's okay. Just hope you feel better. Kuroka said, swishing her tail. Kuroka, whenever she was inside his house, always had her ears and tails out. If she left the house, usually in the company of Issei, she pulled them back into her body to look more human. She also usually had on a wide-brimmed hat, in order to hide herself from the eyes of any of the supernatural, hoping no one spotted her. So far so good for the past four years. Issei nodded and grabbed a banana before grabbing his backpack. He headed out of the house with Akino next to him as Kuroka went to the couch to take a nap. Ever since Akino began living with them, Kuroka had gotten lazier and lazier as Akino would end up picking up the slack. Kuroka was often found napping in Issei's bed or on the couch. Or sometimes, when the sun hit the house at just the right spot, she'd curl up on the carpet next to the window and slept in the sun. Sometimes, all three of them would nap together under the sun. Akino wrapped her arms around Issei's right arm, pulling his arm between her as she walked with her future husband, not that Issei had any clue. At first, Issei was uncomfortable with this but never voiced it, but over time he grew accustomed to it, and began to enjoy it, though for totally different reasons than what Akino had. Issei's reasoning was a bit more depraved. He, her feel like big marshmallows. I wonder what it would be like to put my face where my arm is. He thought in his head as he made an engine sound in his head. Issei would take peeks at her body, as her were massive, 
even bigger than Kuroka's. She wore the school uniform, but there was no size perfect for her to cover those melons. So regardless of what she had on, she would show a generous amount of cleavage. Akino wasn't stupid. She caught Issei many a time taking looks at her and Kuroka when he thought they didn't notice. She had a smile on her face as she walked with Issei, knowing what he was thinking. She just knew that he enjoyed walking with her with his arm between her, and Akino enjoyed this too. Issei might be a bit naive and clueless when it came to their feelings. She understood that they never came out and said it to him that they loved it. She couldn't blame him, but when he looked at her like she was not a friend, but a woman, it made her giddy inside. She couldn't wait to have him for real and to show her how thankful she truly was for him saving her life. She couldn't wait to get her mouth around his pocket rocket and achieve liftoff. The two teens walked in silence as they arrived at Ko Academy, which was the biggest school in the city. The university was on the outskirts of the town but wasn't as massive as most people didn't go to Ko University. They usually went to Tokyo or Kyoto, sometimes even Osaka. Ko, however, was popular with up-and-coming chef, bartenders and other culinary arts so this is why Issei was going to go to school there and was already taking the proper classes. He even had a full-ride scholarship waiting for him, if he did well in his senior year. As they arrived at Ko, Issei's enhanced hearing could hear everything. Who's that Adonis walking with Akino? Do you think she'd let me take him for a ride? Another girl asked her friend. How did he get so close to Akino? Another man asked his friend. Enemy of all men. Die handsome. Spoke another male. Issei felt pride at being the topic of so many people's conversations. He felt pride at his body being desired and grinned at the thought of many men jealous at thinking Akino was his. Of course, they weren't dating so Akino was free to be with whoever she wanted. Issei truly wanted her to be with him. Kuroka as well. True, it was a harem kind of thing, but Issei was a hot-blooded male, what else can anyone expect? Unknown to him, the supernatural were very accustomed to harems and most women didn't mind if a male had multiple wives. After all, most women seemed biual in the supernatural world or at least curious about making it with the same. Unknown to the two teens, they had attracted the focus of a couple people that were not thinking about making it with Issei. Kiba who is the male that Akino is walking with? No idea president. He's a newcomer. Why? Because I have been getting reports about fallen angel activity in my town and I think that boy is about to become an unwilling participant in their activity. You think Akino is part of the activity? She's the only fallen angel we've seen here, so it's not a bad guess. The red-headed woman asked. What do you want to do? Kiba asked. Kiba was an average height male with blonde hair. He was very handsome. But if Kiba was handsome, Issei was drop-dead gorgeous. If Kiba was a 10, Issei was a 15, and the scale never went past 10. I'm not sure yet. Have Kaneko and yourself keep watch over the boy. If the fallen angel does anything remotely suspicious, we eliminate her. Yes, Rias. Kiba said, leaving the room to go handle what he was instructed to do. Rias frowned and kept watch on Issei who was standing with Akino still clinging to him. They were standing before the bulletin board in the schoolyard, where homeroom would be for each student. This boy is a human yet he gives off a strange scent. Smells like power. I can't put my nose on it but maybe he has a sacred gear? She wondered to herself. Hearing the bell, Rias moved and got her things, heading off to class. Akino smiled at Issei. Looks like we'll be in the same homeroom. She said happily. Looks like. I guess homeroom isn't grade dependent. Looks like it's not. I'm hoping we might get a class together. I am as well. But it's doubtful considering I'm a senior and you are a junior. Akino pouted at Issei. Don't say that. We must have a class together. Issei smiled and patted Akino. She's just so darn cute. He thought to himself. The bell rung for the pair so off they want, arm and breast, to their homeroom class. School went by very quickly for the pair, and they ended up at lunch together. So, you were right. We don't have any classes together. Akino said, puffing her cheeks out. I told you. It's because you jinxed it. Akino said, swatting Issei on the arm playfully. Issei smiled and rubbed his arm. Even if she was playful, she still packed quite a bit of wallop. Damn fallen angel strength. Sorry, sorry. He said laughing a bit. But we can at least have lunch together. Our lunch periods stack up. Akino huffed and pouted for a bit longer before she dug into her lunch. She was really disappointed in the fact that Issei and her didn't share any classes together. Perhaps she could get a transfer from her gym into the same period as him? She didn't know but she was really disappointed nonetheless. About two minutes into their homemade meals, which consisted of eggs, rice, bacon-wrapped mini-potatoes, carrot sticks with ranch dressing, 
an apple and a chocolate chip cookie. Issei and Akino's roundtable was approached by not one, but two people. It was Kiba and a white-haired short girl. Mind if we join you? The male asked with a big smile. Akino was about to speak up, as she knew right away who they were, but Issei spoke up first. Not at all. Have a seat. Issei said. Akino stared at them, knowing that they were devils. Why have they approached now? They left me alone for two years. Akino wondered in her head, unhappy with what's going on. Akino, what's wrong? Huh? Oh nothing. Just bad memories. She lied. Issei bought it and patted her leg. It's okay. It'll go away. Issei said, giving her a warm smile. This effectively disarmed her for the time being, getting her back to enjoying her meal. So, new kid, huh? Kiba asked Issei. Yep. I was sent here from my old school. Issei said. You mean you didn't apply to go here like most did? Nope. They decided to send me here for some reason. Never got the reasoning but here I am. Why? Well, most men applied to come here thinking they could get some perverse harem fantasy completed. Issei raised a brow. I see. Well, I have no such depraved reasoning. I see, I see. Kiba said. What's your name? He asked. Issei Hayadu. He said, smiling back at Kiba. Nice to meet you, Issei. I am Kiba Yudo and this is Kaniko Tuju. He said, motioning to the white-haired girl next to him. What it do? She asked. Issei blinked. Did she just use some kind of urban gangster speak? He asked himself before he nodded. Nice to meet you. My lovely friend here is, Akino Haimajima. Kiba said. We know of her. She's quite popular here. She has a reputation for being one of the most desired and respected here. Akino was glaring at Kiba, unknown to Issei. She knew that he was lying through his teeth. They only knew of her because they were devils and spied on her and dug her information up. Is she now? Well that's great. Akino, you have made many friends? Issei asked, turning to Akino. Akino instantly shut down her glare and turned to Issei with a smile. Not really no. I talk with a few students, but you are my only friend Issei. Akino said sweetly. Oh that sucks. You should get more friends, perhaps. She said, wanting the subject dropped as she poked her fork at her food. So Issei. If you had nothing planned after school, how would you like to come join me and Kaneko at our club meeting? We are in the occult research club and I think you would make a great new member. Kiba asked. Issei was about to speak but Akino quickly interjected. Sorry. He can't. He has work after school. She said, staring at Issei to go along with it. Issei didn't say anything but a few seconds later he nodded. Unfortunately, she is right. I have work after school. Oh that's a pity. Kiba said, sending Kaneko a glance. It seems they would have to act soon. She wasn't letting the human out of her sight. It was then the bell rang for a warning period for the next classes to begin. Well, it was nice meeting you Issei. Until next time. Kiba said, likewise. Farewell Kiba. You too Kaneko. He said. Kaneko and Kiba nodded and left, leaving Akino and Issei to clean up the bento boxes before they separated for the next classes. After three more hours of school, Issei was approached by Kiba after school. Oh hey Kiba. Hey Issei. It seems Akino won't be joining you today after school. She was held up for her club. Kiba lied. Oh she's in a club? Oh yeah. She's in the music club. Issei nodded. Akino did enjoy music on her phone. Oh well, tell her I will see her at home then. Issei said, heading off. Will do. Kiba said, his face turning less happy and smiley and getting more serious. Kiba left the area and returned to Rias, who had gotten the principal to summon Akino go the gym after school. About an hour later, the school emptied as clubs weren't actually in session until next month. Issei just didn't know it. Akino was in the gym, and she turned to hear the doors opening, and in came eleven teenagers. She immediately recognized most of them. So, it seems you got greedy and your actions were found out. Rias said, walking calmly towards the fallen angel. Akino noticed the group was spreading out and Akino knew that this was a trap now. She had fallen for it. My actions? I have done nothing. Don't play stupid. We know the fallen angels have been here in my town for weeks now, plotting something and now I've figured it out. That boy Issei was it? Well, he has a sacred gear and you were planning on doing something with him. Akino frowned. I have done nothing. Issei is my friend. Rias, let's just kill her and be done with this. We can deal with the human later. Oh so you can have him in your peerage? We need him more than you do. 
I never said we would take him for our peerages, Sona said with a grin. That being said, you are right. You could use him more. So let's just finish what we came here to do. I have paperwork to do, Rhea sighed. Very well. In the name of the great King Lucifer, you are to be put to death for invading our territory. Begone witch, Rhea said, forming a block of red and black energy before shooting it out at Aquino who was frozen in place. She didn't even get a chance to dodge as the magical energy was quick. Aquino cringed and tried to block it by putting her hands over her face, but she knew it was her time to go. I'm sorry Issei. Goodbye Kuroka. She thought, after hearing some gasping, Aquino opened her eyes and moved her hands down, only to see blue energy surrounding her in a half-sphere shape. Aquino knew what this was. Issei. Aquino exclaimed, I wondered where you went. I talked with someone outside and clubs don't meet until next month, so after a while, it took me forever to find where you went only to see you are being attacked. Issei said, coming in from the entrance. Issei. You. You. Rias exclaimed in shock. She wasn't the only one. The entire devil body was in shock, though Sona wasn't showing much of it. Know of the supernatural? I know plenty about it. I've been a part of the supernatural since I was 13. Now, want to explain what you are doing? Rias! We can deal with the human later. We need to focus. Right. He say, I'm sorry but you must die. Kiba, please be gentle with him, but he can't be here. Here is where you now start listening to a song from me on repeat. The song? Jeezy get back up. Yes, President. Kiba said and walked up to Issei, drawing a sword. Sorry Issei. I hope we can still be friends. He said with a sorrowful smile. Issei frowned at Kiba and when he aimed to knock him in the side of the head with the hilt of his sword, Issei sprang into action. Almost instantly, his arms and hands electrified. It ebbed and flowed as if he was a circuit. Before Kiba could even react, Issei sent in a chop to Kiba's throat with the space between his thumb and his index finger. This stunned Kiba which allowed Issei to kick the back of Kiba's left knee before delivering a spinning roundhouse into the back of Kiba's head, sending him down to the ground. W what? Rias exclaimed, completely shocked. Akino laughed and instantly transformed, her clothing changing to that of a shrine priestess. Issei might be human but he has powers. Now it's my turn, Rias. That human is in cahoots with the fallen angels. We have to kill them both. Sona exclaimed. He wasn't part of this. There's no way. Rias exclaimed. Rias! Wake up. Sona yelled. Yura! Saji! Kill Issei! Everyone else, kill the fallen angel. Sona ordered, pushing her glasses up as she summoned a large amount of water and flung it at Akino who dodged it. Yes, President! Everyone exclaimed as they got to work. Issei growled at the words of hearing his Akino being threatened with death. He was mad now. Issei turned to Sona and the ones attacking Akino. He noticed that Rias and Kaneko were more focused on Kiba who was getting up now. Issei formed the barrel of energy again before throwing it out into Sona, Tsubaki, Nimura, Momo and Rea. This sent all of them flying before Issei had to duck under a very untrained haymaker from Saji. Issei growled and leapt over a low kick by Yura delivering a powerful knee to her face before a roundhouse kick to her chest sent her back a few feet. If this was only two years ago, his attacks with his knees and feet would be almost useless, despite having worked on the fallen angels. Why? Because his Tuki was trained. It only worked back with the fallen angels with combination attacks with his hands. This time, it was even out. Saji came from behind and punched Issei in the jaw, sending him spinning as Yura stood up. Sorry pal. And no hard feelings but the orders from my king are absolute. Saji said before he and Yura delivered a dual punch to Issei's chest, sending him back into the bleachers. The two of them ran at Issei and Issei knew he had only one chance. He had to use his fists. Issei pushed forward and delivered a powerful elbow to Saji's unprotected nose, sending him crashing to the ground from Issei's enhanced power. Issei saw an opening in Yura's pose and went in delivering a thrusted kick to the inside thigh of Yura's left leg. He got her to stumble which opened her up to a powerful palm strike to her nose with Issei's left hand. Issei followed up with a right jab with his palm, smacking her in the jaw, sending her spinning on top of Saji. Issei spotted Rias and company, only for them to back away and keep away from the fight. Seemed Rias had a change of heart. That worked for Issei who focused on Sona and her peerage, moving in. His first strike came from behind as he grabbed Nimura from behind delivering a knee to her knee, right where her liver was. This got the woman to cry out in surprise and pain, 
before she was sent flying by a barrel of electricity, which sent her crashing into Momo who was casting fire and ice spells at Akino. Sona and Tsubaki were focused on Akino, and had a shield up to protect themselves from Akino's holy lightning. This left the other members to attack, or to be precise, to be attacked. Akino was constantly switching between targets, only to see Issei help her out of a bind. She was injured with many bruises and burns, but she kept fighting. Akino get out of here! Issei exclaimed before being tackled from behind by Yura. Issei! Akino exclaimed, attempting to help Issei only to get sent flying by a blast of water from Sona. Don't think you can help your friend. We shall defeat both of you here and now. Tsubaki, use your weapon on Issei. You too Meguri. Yes president. The two exclaimed. They watched Yuri get launched by Issei who charged his feet with electricity and Neil kicked Yura off of him who was trying to break his leg. They moved in quickly, surprising Issei with their speed. Issei was then slashed by Tomo's sword before being stabbed in the leg by Tsubaki. No hard feelings. Tsubaki said. But you must be eliminated for the sanctity of our peace. Issei stumbled and fell back against the wall, his gut and leg bleeding heavily. He was dying. Damn you and your so-called peace. You people always do this always attack for no reason. Reiya! Issei roared, summoning electricity from the wall sockets and the lighting from the ceiling lights, which sealed up his wounds and gave Issei a boost in energy. It was out of this anger that Issei's power strengthened. Instead of just his arms, his legs and feet also got covered in his electricity. Issei moved faster than before, getting right in front of Tsubaki before delivering an uppercut with his right palm. Sending the woman into the air before Issei leapt up and crashed his knee into her nose, shattering the bone with a sickening crunch. Tsubaki was down for the count. Tsubaki! Sona cried, rushing over to help her queen, only for a blast of lightning to strike where she was going. Akino grinned, blood on her. Don't think you can help your friend. We shall defeat you all here and now, Akino said, mocking the devil king, only to get sent flying by Momo's fire magic sending her into the ceiling before sending her into the ground. This got Sona to turn to Akino with rage in her eyes, forming a powerful wave of water before forming it into a shape of an arrow. Akino! Issei exclaimed as Sona launched it. Issei headed Meguri in the nose, stunning her before grabbing Akino with a bolt of electricity, pulling on it and sending her flying to him and behind him. The water struck the ground and broke several boards of the wood on the waxed wooden floor. Just as Issei done that, Yura came in and delivered a powerful uppercut to Issei's solar plexus, knocking his wind out of him and making the electricity on his body dissipate. This prompted Meguri to swing her sword down, and it cleaved right into Issei's right shoulder, almost cutting his arm off from the shoulder down to his side. His lung was penetrated and this got Issei to collapse on the ground in a heap as blood pooled around him. Sona! It's done! Yura said, breathing heavily as she and Meguri were both bleeding from their nose and mouths. Well done you two. Now on to the fallen angel. Sona said, approaching with Meguri, Momo, Rea, and Yura to approach Akino who was on her hands and knees, bleeding and burnt. Sona formed an arrow of water and sent it right into Akino's gut, sending her flat onto the ground, screaming in pain. You think you can enter a devil's territory and do whatever it is you want? Be gone foul creature! Sona exclaimed. She aimed another arrow, only to stop as she felt an energy rise and the five devils who remained turned to Issei. Rias, Kaneko and Kiba left the gym, abandoning Issei and Akino to the fate Sona wanted, but they also abandoned Sona. Issei was not sparking. Issei wasn't even controlling it. No Issei was a raging electrical storm. His power arced everywhere there was a power source, draining the gym. No the entire school. The lights flickered as Issei slowly stood up. They watched his wound close up and the look on his face was pure rage. Pure, unfiltered, killing rage. They also watched as his light blue electricity changed colors into a dark navy blue. You will not harm her again. Issei roared, launching from the ground, breaking more, wood from the impact of his feet before he slammed into the group, sending them flying across the gym and into the wall on the far side. His shoulder slam emitted a shockwave, affecting all of them which sent them flying. Issei quickly turned to Akino and used his own powers, closing her wound and saving her life. Once again, Issei. Akino said weakly, before passing out, you've all gone too far this time. You've all gone too far. Issei roared and formed a massive ball of electricity in his hands before he flung it at the five devils who were caught like deer in the headlights. It was their end. Right before the energy struck, two massive devil energy signatures appeared out of nowhere. 
A blast of black and red energy destroyed the ball of electricity while a pure white beam of ice came from the smoke and struck Issei in the chest, immediately freezing the teen solid. Sona crashed to her knees, her eyes widened. Sona! Spoke a voice, only to yell it again when Sona passed out. Her energy was gone and with the death of her peerage almost imminent, she passed out from the stress. Issei woke up outside of his house, freezing cold. It was night time when his eyes opened and his first thought was one thing. Akino! Issei exclaimed, looking around frantically. Kuroka pulled him back into her chest, hugging him. Issei! It's okay! Akino's okay she's in the house resting she said, holding the shivering and shaking teen. It's okay! It's okay! She said, consoling the poor teen who passed out in her arms, as the relief washed over him and took away the adrenaline. Kuroka smiled softly before she frowned, looking out towards where the school was. Our days of peace are coming to an end. The next morning came rather quickly for Issei, but when he awoke, he found himself being pinned down to the bed by Akino and Kuroka. Kuroka was completely and Akino was wearing a very thin teddy which was so transparent he could see her bright pink nipples. Well, this is a very nice view he said before turning his head and grinning. I do like me some cherries. He thought to himself, a big grin on his face. He reached down with both hands and grabbed both of S of the two women in his bed, giving them hard squeezes. Oh these feel so nice. I always knew they would feel nice, he said grinning happily. Oh I just love these kinds of dreams. He say sound out loud. Kuroka wiggled in his grasp and without opening her eyes, her sleepy voice rang out. I'm supposed to be the frisky one in the morning, Naya. Good morning, Kuroka said, opening her eyes and staring at Issei with a big grin. Naya, so you always have these kind of dreams? She asked. Issei nodded rapidly. Sure do. You are always in them too. He said with a big grin before he blinked his eyes. Wait my dream Kuroka talked about me having a dream. I'm not dreaming am I? He asked, looking at Kuroka. Kuroka grinned at him. Naya don't think so. She said, her tails beginning to swish back and forth as the lazy cat continued to wake up, and seeing her favorite human touching her in such an intimate way, got the cat to prepare to pounce. And Issei who knew your hand could feel so nice. Spoke a sleepy Akino, who began to rub Issei's chest, scratching his abs. Issei's eyes widened and he leapt from the bed and turned to the women on the bed, who were now looking at Issei. Kuroka was laying on her side, her tails swishing as her eyes narrowed as she stared at her future mate. Akino was on her back but propped herself up with her elbows. Both of them continued to show off their assets. I am so sorry. I thought it was a dream. Please forgive me. I, I would have never have done this if I knew. I'm so sorry. Issei continued to spout, bowing to the women. Before they could speak in return, the doorbell rang and Issei used that time to escape, acting cowardly. Kuroka let out a low hiss, seeing that Issei once again escaped from her clutches. I'll get him one day, Naya. Kuroka said before yawning and curled back up on the bed, immediately falling asleep. Akino stared at Kuroka and sighed, like a cat. She said, standing up and looking at the clock. It was 11 in the morning. Seems we missed school. She spoke out loud, though to herself. She got dressed into a dress and put on some underwear, before heading down the stairs to see what Issei was up to. Issei ran down the stairs and grabbed a shirt on the way from the laundry basket sitting on the dryer. He skidded to a halt and opened the door, only for his eyes to widen. His hands immediately sparked to life and a snarl on his face appeared. Hello? Issei was it? Spoke the male who was up in front, but it was not he who Issei was staring at. Behind him was Rias and Sona, and their respective peerages. Mind if we come in? I do mind. Issei said, slamming the door in the man's face, storming away his hands returning to normal. Outside the door, Serzex laughed a bit. Well, he's full of energy, he said before chuckling at his own humor. Serzex knocked once more on the door. Rias turned to Sona and frowned. I don't like this at all, Rias said. There's nothing else we can do. This is what must be done. We attacked him without a good reason. Sona replied. He attacked us, yet somehow we are at fault. Serzex knocked again while Seraphal turned to the two kings. So if he attacked Kaneko and you attacked him in retaliation, it's really you at fault? Seraphal asked being very serious. She is a fallen angel. Rias exclaimed, who has been here at the Shinto shrine until she was attacked by other fallen angels and the Hayada family has much of a claim to Ko as you do Rias, Serzek said who rang the doorbell. It seemed Issei was ignoring them. Akino came down the stairs and went to the door, 
upon hearing the doorbell a second time. Akino looked around to find Issei but couldn't see him so she opened the door instead. Ah, you must be Akino, Serzek said, only to have the door slammed in his face. He kept a smile on his face. Well, that was just rude, he said laughing a bit before ringing the doorbell again. Seraphal looked up at Serzex, clinging to her wand. Do you think we can get them to forgive them? If Cyrus finds out she trailed off. Yes, I know and he'll find out anyway, but we need to fix this anyway. He said with a sigh before ringing the doorbell again. Kuroka let out a low hiss as she woke up the sound of the doorbell. She could have sworn that was the fifth time it was rung. She glared at the door before hearing it again. Why the fuck is no one answering, Naya? She wondered out loud before putting on her kimono, heading down the stairs. She noticed that the house seemed empty and thought that was peculiar. When she approached the door she instantly halted as her nose and ears twitched. Her eyes turned serious and she quickly dashed away, hoping to find Issei. But it was then that Serzex broke the door down by completely destroying it with his demonic power of destruction. Apologies, but we must speak with he trailed off as his eyes sharpened upon spotting Kuroka. Shit, Kuroka said, immediately summoning some of her sage magic in her hand only for Issei to appear from the kitchen. Who the fuck do you think you are? Issei demanded, throwing a bolt of electricity at Serzek's feet. Get the fuck out of here. Serzek turned to Issei and frowned at him. We've been trying to talk to you for a while now. I have not come for a fight. You have no right being here. Especially bringing them along. He said with venom, glaring at Sona and Rias. Rias looked away sheepishly while Sona just fixed her glasses up on her nose. Serzek sighed. All right, then hear us out and we'll leave. I'll even ignore for today the fact that the stray devil Kuroka is staying here. Oh hell no. Issei said, summoning more of his electricity. You don't make a small threat to my family either. She is an enemy to all devils. Seraphal said, coming from behind Serzex. She sounded quite like a child though Issei could tell she was an adult. Issei walked right up to Seraphal. Yeah, and you devils are my enemy, especially after threatening me, Akino and Kuroka. Issei said, staring down into Seraphal's eyes. Issei was getting very confident. Seraphal, instead of being intimidated, just puffed her cheeks out and pouted. It was an accident. Now, why can't you just let us apologize? Because it doesn't change anything you people continue to cause harm for me and my family. Issei said, looking behind him. Only Akino was spotted and this confused Issei who looked around for Kuroka, only to spot her standing in front of the white-haired girl. Kuroka looked very serious. Her tail was not swishing at all. Kuroka? Kuroka ignored him and Seraphal gently tugged on Issei's shirt, which got him to look down. Can you please away us forgive us? Seraphal begged, looking up at Issei with puppy dog eyes, her bottom lip pouted out. She looked so adorable. Issei faltered a bit and took a step back, not really sure what to do in this situation. Serzex, however, came to his rescue. She's serious we want to at least say we are sorry. Issei sighed. It seemed Seraphal did something to Issei and that was diffuse the tension, as his arms and legs were no longer coated with electricity. All right fine, let's chat. Akino can I ask you to make us some tea? I really like your tea. Issei asked softly. Akino nodded. Sure Issei. She said disappearing into the kitchen. Issei glanced over at Kuroka before taking a seat on a chair. All right, what shall we discuss first? Issei asked. There's a lot to talk about but I guess apologies first. Serzek said, taking a seat on a couch as Rhea sat to his left, and Seraphal sat to his right. To Seraphal's right sat Sona. It was Sona and Rhea stood up. Issei I am sorry I attacked you in Akino. We didn't understand the situation, and we're only looking after our lands. We. I'm very sorry. I should have talked to Akino and got her side of the story. Rhea said, bowing to Issei. Issei gave her a nod but said nothing. It was Sona's turn. Sona cleared her throat. Yes. I, as well, am sorry for attacking you. We should have handled the situation better. I hope that we can put this behind us. She said. Issei frowned slightly but nodded. He didn't like Sona very much. She was very cold and calculating, and this bothered Issei. Rias was emotionally and while it wasn't a good idea to be always emotional, things like apologies should be heartfelt and emotional. Fine I can forgive you. Issei said. As long as it doesn't happen again. Issei said, closing his eyes and sighing, Thank you Issei. Rhea said, giving him a big smile. Can can we be friends? She asked nervously, maybe later. Issei said, looking at Serzex. What else? We want to offer you two things as our own apologies. 
for not explaining to our sisters that you are to be left alone. Serzak said, Oh? Two wishes? Issei asked, laughing a bit. Any rules with that? None. You can have anything you wish, Issei rolled his eyes. Please. There's always a limit of what you can do. So for your wish, if I wanted land within the underworld and the right to rule, you'd do that? If I wanted to take Seraphal as my slave, she'd go along with that? How'd you know Seraphal was a submissive? Serzak asked, which got Issei to blink. I didn't. I was just... Okay look, we both know you are just trying to throw me off my game now. No need to start lies and rumors. So, what are the limits? Issei asked, getting a hold on his sanity. Oh it wasn't lies and rumors. Serzak said, teasing Seraphal who just pouted cutely and looked away. Sona was face palming and Rias was blushing, as well as both peerages. Saji was the only one not blushing, except he stared at Seraphal with. As for the limits, I can't give you everything, you are right, but I can at least tell you if your wish can be granted or not. So, do you have any wishes? Issei hummed. Can I get cash these in later? Seraphal and Serzak looked at each other and nodded. Sure. Serzak said. Then, what's the next thing on the agenda? Issei asked, crossing his arms. He wasn't angry looking anymore. Seemed he did forgive them quickly. A good heart, Kuroka. He said, glancing back at the cat who was still standing in front of Kaneko who was staring up at Kuroka. What about her? She's my family. She killed her master and per our law, she is to be put to death. Serzak said, Oh is that so? Well I can assure you that won't happen. Kuroka is mine. She belongs to me and belongs in this house. She is to be left alone. She is insane and dangerous. So am I. That being said, do you even know why she killed her master? Or are you guys just that quick to put blame? Serzak frowned. It wasn't me who lead the investigation. He said. I am only going off of what I know. Then whoever led the investigation is either incompetent or corrupt. Kaneko can you come over here? He asked the white haired girl. With a nod she moved around Kuroka and stood next to Issei's chair. Issei gently guided her to stand between his legs and face the devils. She didn't look nervous or anything, in fact she had no emotion on her face. But her eyes looked nervous if you looked deep enough. Kuroka killed her master because of this child. This is Kuroka's sister, and Kuroka killed her master to protect her sister. You have any idea what that devil was doing? Issei asked and Serzak shook his head. Issei stood up and gently patted Kaneko on the head letting her relax against his tummy. That man tortured his servants in order to get them stronger. While I do not like those things, it's perfectly legal. He went outside of his peerage and prepared to go after Kaneko and do the same to her, to drag her into his peerage. That man attempted to hurt an innocent young cat and force her to do things. I bet that's not legal. Serzak frowned and looked at Seraphal, who shrugged. She basically said I dunno. Kaneko looked right at Kuroka who looked away from Kaneko, embarrassed and shy. You did that because he was gonna do that? Yes, Kuroka said quietly. I didn't want you hurt. Kaneko looked up at Issei for a moment before moving away from him and going to her sister, where the two of them continued to stare at each other like before. Issei crossed his arms and stared down at the two Satans. So, here's what you should do. You are going to remove the bounty on Kuroka's head, and you are going to tell people what that man was doing. It's not that easy. Serzak said, you will make it easy because that is my wish from you. Issei said. Kuroka heard this and her eyes widened, seeing Issei use up one of his wishes to save her. He was even standing up for her against powerful enemies, ones that would kick her ass very quickly. She couldn't help but smile at this. Serzak smirked and nodded. So be it. I have no issue with fulfilling this wish. He said. Issei gave him a smile and nodded. Good. Is that all? He asked. I need to eat breakfast if you don't mind. Issei said only for his tummy to rumble which made Issei's statement very true. Serzak nodded. Sure, sure. I'll head out. He said with a chuckle. Until next time Issei. Tell Cyrus I said hello. Serzak said as he teleported out. Issei was about to ask him how he knew his father, but Serzak was gone. Issei sighed and turned to Rias and Sona. Anything else to say? Issei asked. Sona shook her head and with that she teleported out on her magic circle along with her peerage. That left Rias and her peerage as well as Seraphal. Issei then noticed Seraphal had snuck up and stood before him. Geez, you are hard to notice sometimes. He said with a laugh. Did you mean it? Seraphal asked. Mean what? That you want me as a slave? 
Seraphal asked, tilting her head cutely as she bounced around on her feet. Issei's sweat dropped and immediately became unable to answer. Luckily, Rias came to his rescue. Lady Seraphal, that's not the way to get someone to like you. You need to take it slower and ask him out on a date. She said, hoping to dissuade the Satan. Unfortunately, things didn't go as planned. Mao, you're right. Seraphal said with a cute pout before turning back to Issei. I shall take you on a date. I shall see you Saturday, she said before teleporting away on her own magic circle. Issei blinked and stared at where Seraphal was only to look at Rias. She's not serious, is she? Rias looked sheepish as she blushed. I think she was. Seems you attracted a Satan. I wait. She was one of the leaders? Yep. Sir's ex is also a leader, the man you were talking to. He's also my brother. Great. Just fucking great. Why did you have to give her that idea? He demanded of her. There are worse ways to die than going on a date with a Satan. Rias said, teasing Issei which got Issei to narrow his eyes. Noticing that Akino had not returned with the tea, he frowned. She was hiding, but Issei wouldn't confront her until later. I guess I'll let her down nicely Saturday. Issei said with a sigh. Issei smiled at Rias. So, what can I do for you? Rias was about to argue about denying Seraphal a date, but Rias decided not to. Rias smiled. Well, I was hoping that in order to foster better friendship between us you join the occult research club. She asked, hoping that he would accept her offer. She figured asking him to be a devil was too much but this way, she might still have a shot. Issei glanced over her shoulder at Kuroka, who was now having a quiet conversation in the corner with Kaneko. Issei wondered what they were talking about, but even his enhanced hearing couldn't pick it up. Issei looked back at Rias and hummed a bit. Sure. Sure why not? I'm not angry anymore and I could use a club. He said, wonderful. Since tomorrow is Friday and a half day, we can meet at lunch and I can take you there. She said smiling, Issei nodded. And you aren't concerned about that? He asked, pointing over at Kuroka and Kaneko. It's not up to me. That is Kaneko's choice and she seems to have accepted it. Rias said nodding, Issei nodded. Probably for the best. I don't have any control over Kuroka so I think she would have caused more problems if you told her no. He said with a laugh. She's a troublemaker. Issei said, Rias nodded. Was it true though? About what she did? It's what Kuroka said and I trust her. She she hasn't done anything to make me not trust her. Rias nodded. It's very likely what she said is true. I'm sure my brother will find out what happened for real. She said before smiling at Issei. Well, guess I shall leave and get out of your hair. Probably for the best today. I need to wind down and talk with the other members of my house. I also need to eat. Mind if Kaneko stays? Issei shrugged. Doesn't bother me. She's engrossed in talking with Kuroka that it would be rude to take them away. Rias nodded. All right, see you tomorrow Issei. Bye Rias. Issei said, heading to the kitchen. He spotted Akino sitting on the counter, staring at a cup of tea. Akino? Why? Why did you forgive them so easily? Because hating someone or something for so long will only consume you it is better to forgive and forget instead of fester your hatred. Issei said, gently moving between Akino's legs and holding her hands gently rubbing them. Are you mad at me? A little. Why did you put your life on the line? She asked, glaring at him. You could have died and you are only a human. She asked, looking at him angrily. Because I don't know what I would do if I lost you, he said quietly. Looking at her hands now. I don't want you to leave me, he said. Akino smiled softly and quickly hugged Issei's head to her, holding him tightly to her. Oh Issei. I don't want to lose you either cause I love you. Akino said, taking Issei's for her own. ING him deeply and passionately. Issei was released from the lip lock with Akino after 20 seconds. His body had frozen up and when the fallen angel released him, he stumbled back a bit and crashed back onto the table, sitting on the dining room table. I you? You were serious about the flirting was. Akino smiled and climbed off of the counter, hopping onto the tile. Yes Issei. It was all serious I fell in love with you a long time ago she said, climbing onto the table and into Issei's lap straddling his waist as she pushed him down onto the table, leaning down to his once more. However, it was not to be as there was two people standing in the doorway to the kitchen. Naya, well what do we have here? Kuroka asked playfully, her tails swishing behind her. In front of her was Kaneko, who was staring at the pair. What you two? You WR. Weren't joking? Naya Issei. I have always loved you ever since you were 13. 
You saved my life and I was attracted to you and it's only grown in time, Naya, Kuroka said staring down at him while her tails were swishing back and forth in happiness. I thought you were only joking the entire time you never truly came out and admitted it, because I didn't want to ruin our friendship, Naya. Well that's not true, Naya. I was waiting until you were older before I made my move, but Akino seemed to have decided she had enough waiting, Naya haha. Kuroka said with a laugh. Naya, suppose I should thank her. I would have had to wait longer. I was going to wait until your birthday to make my move but this works fine too, Naya. The cat said with a smile. I'm not entirely sure honestly, but I gave them my word at the time. And I don't go back on my word. Issei said as he fried up some eggs and sausage. Are you sure they won't try to hunt us again? I don't know, but even if they do, I have to give them the benefit of the doubt. I guess I can understand them attacking you, but it doesn't change that they almost hurt you. I will always be there to protect you Akino. He said in which Akino gave him on his, I know and I will be there for you as well. Akino said patting his cheek. Well I trust your judgment and choices. Issei nodded and the pair of them sat down and had a nice breakfast while watching some cartoons. They ate for about half an hour before Issei was pushed out of the kitchen by Akino who demanded to let her do the dishes for him since he cooked, so he could go get a shower and get going. Issei had argued many times against her, but when she took out a wooden spoon to whap him upside the head, Issei bolted. Many times had his own mother brandished such a weapon and it was a fearsome one. Issei climbed the stairs in record time, immediately removing his underwear, which was the only thing he was wearing even at breakfast before grabbing a new change of underwear and shorts before climbing into the shower, which he turned on to make it nice and hot. He let out a low groan from the pleasure of the hot water on his back, which soothed the muscles on his back which were strained from the eventfulness of the night before. He didn't even notice until there was a sponge on his back. Naya, we really did a number on you didn't we? Kuroka asked playfully as she scrubbed the somewhat bleeding back of Issei who had many many scratch marks on him which some drew blood. One or two might leave a scar. Oh we both know it was all you and your damn nails. Issei said with a laugh before turning and enveloping Kuroka in a hug and a, holding her flush against him as her tails wrapped around his right thigh. His hands held her waist and her hands were tangled in his hair as she had him lovingly. It wasn't rough but it wasn't gentle. It was passionate. Issei pulled away shortly and the two lovers would wash each other's backs and fronts no. They just washed each other and they both enjoyed themselves doing it, getting even more familiar with the other's bodies. Perhaps even more familiar as it wasn't an arriving horny frenzy that they touched and caressed each other. After they had successfully cleaned each other, Kuroka brought Issei down to sit in the tub as the shower poured around them. She laid her head on his shoulder, nuzzling into his neck. Her hands gently pawed at his chest and shoulders, simply wanting to be close to him. Naya you're such you're not like any man I've ever met. Kuroka said, playful and serious at the same time, which is why her tick wasn't as playful as it usually was. Am I'm just a human. It's not you being a human, Naya it's you being a man. She said ing his neck. You're super kind, and you care for me truly. You don't care that I am an Ikomata or a Nekashu for that matter. You don't care that I am powerful. You see me for who I am and it means a lot. I love you Issei, Kuroka said seriously, looking up at Issei with her cute eyes. I love you too Kuroka. You are very kind yourself. You don't care that I am different. You don't care that I am a human and weaker than you. You see me for me and that means a lot too. He said smiling at her before ing her again. They sat there for a few more minutes before Issei stood up, bringing a whining Kuroka with him. He turned off the shower and gave her her own towel before taking his own, drying himself off. After about 10 minutes, the pair got dressed. Issei was wearing a pair of grey track shorts and a grey wife beater, before putting on a pair of grey socks and black shoes. Kuroka Kuroka didn't have anything to wear other than kimonos, so she just had an arsenal of the same clothing style. But it was just who she was. After Issei got dressed, he turned to give Kuroka a, only to find her back on the bed, curled up and already fast asleep. Lazy cat he said, sighing and heading down the stairs. Akino was tidying up the kitchen, finishing up with the counters. They weren't that messy, but she made sure it was clean and disinfected. She was wearing one of his shirts and a purple thong, smiling at him as he appeared in the kitchen. You be safe okay? Akino said, slinking into his arms and giving him a very quick before pulling away. I will. Everything will be okay. He said, giving Akino's forehead a before he walked out the door, closing it behind him. Issei arrived at the school as it was being let out. He was sitting down on the school steps, hoping to be spotted by Rias or someone in the ORC to bring him to where the club was. 
However, luck was not on his side right now as it was Sona who appeared. Both of them stiffened upon seeing one another, and Issei had clenched his fists as well. She was the mastermind behind it all the one who truly went to kill Akino. Rias had the sense to get her team out of there, but Sona continued the attack. Issei did not like Sona, despite how friendly he was in his house to her. He hated her. Sona on the other hand didn't like him either. This human was harboring not one but two evil creatures. Akino a fallen angel. An enemy of devils but the worst was Kuroka. SS class stray devil, known for killing so many of the pursuit squads and this man somehow got her to be excused of her crimes? Issei was someone she could not stand, ignoring the law for his own personal wants but Sona had to play along. She had to place nice, and she had no choice in the matter. Plus if what she heard was correct this human might become her brother-in-law. Unacceptable. So you played hooky? Typically you are a troublemaker. Funny. I could say the same to you about being a troublemaker or maybe I should just call you a murderer? He said staring at her. Both of them held killing's auras towards each other. Before Sona could respond, Kaneko appeared behind Issei. Arrow Issei. Let's go. The white-haired Nekisha said. While Issei wasn't a fan of being nicknamed that, he couldn't really deny it. He truly was erotic wasn't he? With the chance to avoid another altercation with Sona, Issei quickly got to his feet and followed the white-haired devil away. He could feel Sona glaring daggers at his back as he retreated. You're going to regret this Rias he'll hurt you. Sona though before returning to the school building, Issei entered the ORC club room behind Kaneko. She took a seat on the couch to his left, and he decided to take a seat on the couch to his right. Ten seconds after he sat down, Rias and Kiba came through the double doors. Oh hi Issei. Rias said waving at him. Issei nodded but didn't return the wave. He didn't even smile. Rias. Was all he said. Rias frowned at the coldish greeting but didn't comment. So, you didn't show up to school today either? Did you expect me to? He asked, raising a brow. No I suppose I don't blame you. Look I'm sorry I had Kiba try and kill you and I'm sorry for trying to kill your friend. I was wrong. Look, what's done is done. You can't change that fact, but I can tell you are truly sorry so in due time, I'll forgive you, but for right now, I'm sorry but I really am unhappy with all of you. Issei said frowning. I might have told the Devil Kings I forgave you all but I don't. I haven't forgiven you. I what can I do? Give me time. Show me that you devils aren't as bad as you look. Show me that you are good people. Issei said. I alright. Rhea said. Kiba and Kaneko were both looking at their feet, both of them looking sorry for what they have done. I will do what I can but you may not like what I have to say now. Oh? Issei asked curious. I asked you to join cause I need help. Issei frowned and crossed his arms, staring at the Crimson Princess. You tricked me? No. I truly do want to be friends just I am desperate. How desperate? I am very desperate. I'd do anything to fix this but I'm running out of options. She said looking at him with tears now. This surprised the human boy. You're not kidding Issei said. What what is it you want from me? Please save me from my marriage. Was all Rhea said before an orange magic circle appeared on the ground behind Issei. Issei turned around to the strong scent of men's cologne. Then the scent of soot and brimstone entered his nostrils. Issei rubbed his nose. The senjutsu training really increased the sensitivity of his senses. Out from the circle came a man as tall as Issei, with short blonde hair and dark blue eyes. He had a red blazer with a gold embroidery with matching pants and black dress shoes. It was rich man's clothing, but with how he was wearing it he looked more like a punk. He had a few ons undone on the top, revealing a very muscular chest. Ah Rias. Riser has arrived in the human realm. Riser has come all this way to see you my dear. Issei raised a brow at how the man was talking but shook his head. Ah you must be Rias's fiance. Issei spoke with a smile. Akino had taught him how to act proper for times like this, so he wouldn't make things worse. Riser frowned and looked at Issei like he was a bug. And you are interrupting Riser's time with Rias because? Because I am here to help Rias out of the marriage with you. She has asked me to stop the marriage. Rias, Riser is displeased. You send this lowly human to stop the marriage? Have you fallen so low Rias? Rias glared at Riser. Do not insult him. He is more of a man than you. Fuck you. Rhea seethed. Riser grinned like a feral animal. Oh my. Such strong feelings for a human. I guess Riser has to crush the human before you in order for you to get the message. Riser is the strongest. Issei frowned. You're a why little devil aren't you? You really think you can win? Riser laughed. 
I am a phoenix and like the name implies, we are immortal like the birds. And? You think immortality makes you unable to lose? You really need a reality check. Riser laughed again. Even if you could defeat me human, you don't realize what is to happen. You are to fight my entire peerage and myself. The devil spoke before snapping his fingers. Behind Riser appeared a magic circle, and then flame rose from the circle. When the bright orange flames disappeared, his peerage appeared. All of them. Fifteen women came out from the flames. You really think you have a chance now, boy? Issei frowned and looked around at the peerage. So me versus all of them. And that's fair how? Rias frowned. Sorry Issei it's our rules. And one versus one fights aren't allowed? They are. Spoke a female that had blonde hair the same color as Riser's but her hair was in drill shape. But you can't force it. The most common way for these to go is peerage versus peerage, said the girl in a snooty tone, and let me guess. Riser won't fight me man to man? Correct. Why would I lower myself to fight someone like you? You continue to insult me, Issei said with a sigh. Are you this much of a coward? Excuse me? Riser seethed. I asked if you are this much of a coward. Let me explain why I ask. First off, you refuse to fight me by yourself because you claim that I'm beneath you. You don't even know my name yet you insult me? That's honestly sad. 2. You assume I don't have a peerage either, so I'd be at a disadvantage. Incorrect. I may not be a devil but I have people that I have magically sealed with me so to speak, so this would suffice as a peerage. 3. You continue to want Rias as a wife for what fucking reason exactly? She doesn't want to marry you yet you are forcing it upon her? What coward does that to a woman? Issei said, shaking his head. You are an embarrassment. He said before looking at what Issei assumed was Riser's sister. I'm sorry for what you have to put up with. Ravel gave him a small smile before she stopped cause Riser glared at her. You insolent little whelp. I will enjoy destroying you on the battlefield. Riser said, seething in hatred. Issei sighed and was about to say something when the sister spoke up. You insult my brother. Why? I'm not really insulting him. I'm just stating a fact. Just because the truth hurts doesn't mean it's an insult. Your brother, which I am assuming you are siblings, is a coward. Look at what he has done, and what he plans on doing. It's cowardly. She stared at him curiously before Riser spoke up. Ravel. That human is nothing but trash to us. Ravel looked at her brother, and cowed away from her brother's stare. And now you try to make your sister think like you? She is my younger sister, and I will do what is best for my family. Riser glared. Before Issei could respond, a silver circle appeared and out came someone dressed as a maid. Graphia. Graphia. What are you doing here? Rias asked, concerned. Serzex had some concerns about this. He was concerned that there would be some fighting here and called me in to settle it which is why if anyone here fights I will personally stop them. Graphia said, staring at Issei and Riser. When given such cold and ominous words from the strongest queen, even Riser would be fearful. Riser said, standing up straight. And you Issei Hayadu? Are you going to behave? I had no plans on fighting here and now. Issei said. If that's what you wanted to hear, good. Hayadu Riser said, only to stare at Issei. He. He can't be. Yes. Issei is the son of Cyrus Hayadu. Also known as the virus. Now then, am I to understand there is to be a raiding game? Graphia asked. Riser looked absolutely terrified, but he quickly gained his composure. Yes. My peerage versus Hayata's peerage. In TW3 weeks. Riser said coughing. Hayata here is new to raiding games and needs to train. Riser said. Issei narrowed his eyes. Apparently, hearing the name Cyrus Hayata was enough to get Riser to stop insulting him and not fight him here and now. Something was fishy and Issei needed to ask why Cyrus was so feared. So three weeks from today? No. Three weeks from this Saturday. That way it's a weekend. Riser nodded. So be it. Now Riser must take his leave. He said quickly before disappearing rather suddenly. Issei was not the only one surprised. Even Rias and her peerage was. Graphia seemed impassive as always. Anyone want to explain to me what just happened? It's best your father explains to you that, though I doubt he would tell you. Graphia said. You should be lucky though. You have been given three weeks to get strong enough. Graphia said. I shall go and prepare the raiding game for you. Good day, Graphia said before disappearing in a magic circle. Issei scratched his head before sighing. Guess I need to head out and figure out what I'm going to do. I don't know how I'll beat Riser, Issei said, sulking out of the room without saying anything to Rias or the others. 
Rios looked a bit confused but also relieved. Think he can pull this off president? Kiba asked. I don't know but for my sake I hope so. She said with a frown. East say hum to himself as he walked home. The teenager was deep in thought, scratching his chin. Up ahead a few hundred feet, a dark blue portal opened up and a woman with green skin and red hair stumbled out of it. East say didn't pay any attention as his mind was spaced out. His body was on autopilot as he was returning to his house. But his mind didn't register anyone else in the area, which there was only the woman. Issei was shaken awake as a very sultry and silky smooth voice reached his ears. He stopped and his eyes focused in on the woman who had called out to him, looking at her. Ah, apologies. Something I can help you with? He asked. His eyes moved from her face to take in the rest of her person. She wore a very light purple sweater though it wasn't very good at covering her body. It stopped an inch under her, revealing her stomach and her belly on. She had a pair of dark green track pants on and green shoes. Her eyes were a very brilliant light green. She was absolutely gorgeous. Hot damn. She looks like a model. Issei thought before looking back into her eyes and kept them there. The woman on the other hand studied the male before her for a moment. She watched his eyes dip down, and she let out a frown for a moment before she stopped frowning as his eyes went back to her eyes. He is just like him studying me for reasons other than perversion. Interesting. I just wanted to know where I am is all. She asked in her sultry tone, Ah. You are in cool though I'm curious about how you don't know that you're in the middle of the town. I got lost. She said simply. Where is Ko exactly? Do you know where Gotham is? To answer your first question, Ko is in Japan and it's about a hundred miles from Tokyo. As for Gotham I've never heard of that city. He said with a small smile. If you want, I can see if the library has any information on it. The woman frowned for a split second before moving towards Issei, her smile disarming. Oh, you would do that for me? You are such a good man, I can't help but give you a token of my appreciation. She said, smiling as she hugged Issei's shoulders and leaned in, her puckered. Issei immediately grabbed onto her forehead and pushed her off of him, surprising her with his strength. She was a very strong woman, but she was overpowered. This surprised her cause the man didn't look like he would be that strong. Sorry, but your thanks is enough for me. Issei said. Now shall we get going? The woman narrowed her eyes and clenched her fists. Before Issei could even respond, several vines came from out of the ground and wrapped him up like an anaconda would a deer. Issei gasped in response to the sudden attack upon him, and with plants no less. He looked at the woman who was looking at him like one would look at trash. Seems I underestimated your strength as a man. Guess I will have to do this with force. She said, pulling Issei to him with the vines as if they obeyed her command. Issei panicked for a second before he summoned his power. He immediately began to arc his electricity through his body which got the vines to also begin to spark. Despite myths, plants conduct electricity. Wood does not. Plants, even trees, have moisture and liquid inside them. They produce their own electricity just like humans and animals do. Vines have water inside them so they would act like wires. As such, the electricity went through the vines and into the ground but it forced the vines to convulse and release their prisoner. The woman's eyes went wide and immediately threw out a spinning hook kick which was a kick that spun around in an 180, generating massive power and aimed at the head or upper parts of the opponent. Issei's head was the prime target but Issei wasn't a normal fighter. Issei grabbed onto her ankle and held her still as the man stared at her. I think you have underestimated me greatly. Issei said before sending a powerful volt of electricity into her body getting her to yell out in pain and surprise before Issei released her ankle. She collapsed on the ground. She turned onto her back and attempted to get back up. But she found Issei standing above her before he fell to his knees and sat on her waist, grabbing her forehead with his right hand and aiming his left hand at her for a punch. She immediately covered her face with both arms but Issei then grabbed both of her wrists and held them to her sides before using his right hand to hold both of her wrists above her head. She was at his mercy and she knew it. Explain. Was all Issei said, staring down at her. The woman under him was feared and blushed a bit, especially at the position she found herself in. It's been a long time since a man other than the one who haunted her back in Gotham, had her positioned in a similar manner. It was kind of hot to her. Explain what? She said, trying to not sound scared and she succeeded. Why attack me? I was being nice. I needed to you. Me? Why would you want to do that? You don't know me. Issei asked, really confused. My ES forces men and women to be my obedient puppets. You were to be my assistant in this new world as I figure it out. New world? He asked. 
and wait your yes can do that? How? I am a botanist, and I created a tick that forces beings to my will. Oh, that's kinda cool actually. I have powers myself. I can use electricity. Yes, I can see that. She said, raising a brow at the teenager. The woman was older than Issei by quite a few years, yet here she was at his mercy. She had to wonder why she wasn't covered in bruises at this point, but she wouldn't ask for bruises either. She also wondered why the teenager wasn't angry with her, and had suddenly said that her tick is cool. Well, it's true, Issei said with a grumble. So what did you mean by new world? If if I had to hazard a guess I am in a separate dimension. Gotham would be one of the most well-known places, just like Metropolis would be as well. Never heard of either. The most well-known cities are New York, Paris, Las Vegas and a few others but I've never heard of Gotham or Metropolis. Like I said, I think I am in a new dimension so I was hoping to get a fresh start here and rebuild. And to do that, you turn me into one of your personal flying monkeys? I'm not a witch. The woman scowled. But the point still remains. Issei said with a frown. The woman shrugged. It's how I do things. Issei frowned for a moment before shrugging. He released her and stood up, staring at her for a moment. Well, just be careful doing it here. You are in a new world and you may find out doing such things will get you in very big trouble. You could be put to death very quickly here. Thanks for the advice so. The library? She said, trying to lighten the mood. Oh no. You already had your shot at the library. Issei said. Now you can just suffer. Issei huffed. The woman grinned. This teen was a very interesting boy. Oh don't be like that. She said, her sultry tone seeping once more. Can't you forgive little old me just this once? She asked, attempting to seduce the man. Nice try. Issei said with a grin. As hot as you are, you're still a mystery to me and I don't fuck on the first date. He said with a laugh. The woman smiled at him for a moment. Ah this is what it was like with Daniel way back then. She thought. She had a big smile on her face from the memories. Same with her I wonder if she came with. So what's your name? Issei asked. Poison Ivy. She replied to the teen's question. Is okay what's your real name? That isn't a name parents give their children. Issei said. That's like calling me Electric Man or the Zapper. She sighed. Pamela Isley. See. Was that so hard? Issei teased. It's an adorable name. Poison Ivy glared at him and Issei just grinned. Let's go Miss Ivy. You need a place to stay no? He asked. The woman kept glaring at him. Why are you so nice? What do you mean? I'm a nice guy. No there's no way. There is no way you are this nice especially after what I tried to do. What's your angle? She asked, narrowing her eyes at the stronger teen. Oh that's easy. I wanted to see you so I'm going to peek on you in the shower. He said, sounding completely serious. I know when someone is screwing with me. She said, the older woman crossing her arms over her chest. Issei shrugged. Think whatever you like. Mmm, -hmm, shower cameras. He said, walking off towards his house, not looking back to see if she was following him. The woman continued to glare before she followed the teen. Such a strange boy. She thought as she walked faster to catch up to the teen who was going back into deep thought. Wonder what's on his mind. He's once again spacing out. After a five-minute silent walk, Issei suddenly refocused back to the world around him and activated a magic circle, surprising the woman next to him. Magic? Seems some things are the same between our worlds. She thought as he put the magic circle up to his ear and then removed it. The circle was around his ear like a headphone. Dad, I need to ask you a question. Do you still have the race fear? Can you come home? He asked in rapid succession. Ivy couldn't hear the conversation but Issei looked a bit sad. You can't come home shit what do I do? Wait you have the race fear? Any way you can send it here? You can? Thanks. Uh I plan on activating it again to amplify my powers. Yes I figured there's a chance it would backfire but I have to try. Because I'm saving my friend from a marriage. Alright thanks dad. Issei said closing the magic circle and sighing. Wanna explain to me what just happened? Ivy asked. Uh. What parts exactly? Well what was with that circle thingy? It's magic. Magic exists in this dimension. It did in our world too. So, what did you talk about with your father? Well, to make a long story short. I have to save this girl from an arranged marriage and now I need to reactivate the object that gave me powers and hopefully, it doesn't kill me. Hopefully it just amplifies my powers. You're risking your life in order to save someone from a marriage? Yep. That is the gist of it. I cannot get stronger from where I am. 
My body has reached its limit, and I haven't figured out a way to get past the hump I'm on. So this is my solution, and I don't have another. The only way to solve this problem is with violence, and while I do not like that I have to use violence to solve my problems, I will do so. I mean I enjoy a good fight but for politics and such? Disgusts me. I don't like politics, Issei said, rambling on. Ivy smiled a bit. You remind me of a crime fighter back in Gotham. He would do anything in order to do what is right to him. You might get along with him, but he's probably dead. Probably? I will. The reason I left my dimension is that this villain known as the Joker got his hands on a very powerful dirty bomb he probably wiped Gotham off the map and contaminated. The water surrounding Gotham. Arkham Asylum is gone too more than likely while I and many others attempted to escape. I heard about these portals that would appear at certain times and certain locations, and it just so happened a portal appeared just in time to save me. I don't know if anyone else survived except myself. I tried to get my girlfriend to come with me but I couldn't reach her when the bombs were going off. I'm sorry. That really sucks. I would have loved to meet her and this crime fighter. Ivy smiled. You're sweet. Not a typical man men usually are only good for destruction. Hey, I like to destroy things too. He said grinning as he raised his hand and sent a powerful lightning bolt at a trash can, blowing it up. It fried all the trash, disintegrating them. Congrats. You just saved the earth a bit by destroying trash. Like I said, not a typical man. Ivy said with a grin, teasing the teen who just puffed his cheeks out, whatever. Issei said, opening the gate to his home, before closing it and locking it behind him. Well, this is where I live right now. Yes, I do come from money, but no, I'm not a snob a rich kid. I can tell you aren't. You're just an arrogant childish teenager. Ivy grinned. Issei glared at her before huffing. It was then a black blur came out of the house and tackled into Issei's chest, clinging onto him like an animal. Naya, I miss you Issei. Welcome home, Naya. She said with a purr, nuzzling the boy. Her tail was swishing behind her as her ears twitched. Ga. Hello to you too, Kuroka. Ivy, meet Kuroka. Kuroka, meet Ivy. Issei said, gently petting the Nakomata on the head. Kuroka looked over Issei's shoulder, studying the green-skinned woman with curiosity. Hello? Ivy said, staring at the pair who were cuddling. Hello? Kuroka said, being serious. You smell like a garden. She said, sniffing. And you look like something that coughs up hairballs. Ivy retorted with a smirk. All right. That's enough. No need for you two to fight. Issei said, carrying Kuroka off into the house as Ivy followed. Naya, whatever you say Issei dear Kuroka replied. Issei sighed and shook his head. He tossed Kuroka onto the couch before making his way over to the closest door under the stairs. He opened the door and fumbled around for the light switch. After turning it on, he placed his hand onto the wall to his left, which was to the left of the door, and began to feel around. After a few moments, part of the wall pushed in and revealed the keypad. Issei was given the code and entered it. It was his birth date. His father truly loved him. Issei? Kuroka asked, walking up confused. She has never seen that keypad nor knew there was something hidden. A door opened up across from the closet door and revealed a very small hallway but at the end of the hallway was an elevator. Akino appeared wearing nothing but an apron, holding some tea. Hey Issei, I got you some tea what's going on here? She asked, looking at Ivy and then at the open door. Issei looked over at Akino and gave her a big warm smile. Oh, I'm going to get stronger, he said before moving into the closet and then into the elevator. Everyone followed him shortly, crowding into the small elevator which moved with a lurch, going down. Upon arrival, which only seemed to move down about four floors, came upon a large laboratory. A lot of computers and terminals as well as tables and chairs inside as well as what looked like a gas chamber with a large metal bed. The bed had five straps. Issei how exactly do you plan on getting stronger? Akino asked, staring at the chamber with the bed. I'm going to recreate the accident that made me. I am going to activate the weapon that my father and mother created. Issei that's dangerous. I forbid it. Akino said, grabbing Issei by his hand who didn't pull away. He turned to her and smiled. I appreciate your concern but there's no other way. I promise to save Rias from her marriage. That bitch who tried to kill me. Akino demanded. Why would you say that? She apologized and she left us alone after I beat up Kiba. She cares more about her own people than she does her orders. I wanted to give her a chance to earn the forgiveness, and this is me being nice you know that if I didn't help her I wouldn't be me. He said which got Akino to smile, ing his hand as she nuzzled into it. Alright but you better make it. Oh I plan to. 
I have no plan on dying tonight. Haven't seen enough boobs or had enough yet. He said, grinning at his two girlfriends. Kuroka grinned as her tail wagged while rolled her eyes and smiled. Issei grabbed onto the blue sphere and placed it into the microwave-looking machine. Clamps grabbed onto the sphere and held it upright. Issei smiled at Ivy. You going to stay and watch? If you want, you should check out the backyard. You might like it. He said. Ivy shrugged. I can wait. I am curious about what's going to happen and I'm curious about this world. Issei nodded. I will show you my garden when I'm done. He said with a big smile before removing his t-shirt and his shorts. Leaving him in only his underwear. I should get but we have a guest. He chuckled. Nothing I haven't seen before. Ivy said, waving away his concern before Issei laughed. Perhaps but it's common courtesy. Issei said with a shrug as he began typing away on the computer nearby before moving to the console, setting up commands. There was a timer on the console for two minutes which was counting down. Opening up the chamber, Issei stepped in and the computer strapped him in automatically around his wrists, ankles and his waist. He settled in and wiggled a bit, getting comfortable as the table reclined a foot, getting his feet off the ground but keeping him mostly upright. The chamber then sealed completely, air hissing as it went airtight. The timer ticked down and when it hit zero, the microwave-like machine immediately began sparking blue as the weapon was activated and the power was running through the massive cables that led to the chamber. Issei looked up and spotted a four-way metal rod that had bulbs at each end and the bulbs began sparking. Issei then realized he's in a metal chair and that is when the electricity from the weapon began arcing down into the chamber, electrocuting him. Issei began screaming in massive pain as the foreign energy began coursing through his body. Issei kept screaming as his body convulsed as if in a seizure. Akino and Kuroka ran up to the console and looked at it with concern. The console showed an image of a human body, which was meant to be Issei's. It was flashing red with a big red warning, critical. That was flashing over and over. It was Kuroka who noticed that the console was locked by a password by Issei. Issei. You idiot. Kuroka said, moving to the chamber and attempting to open it forcefully with Senjutsu. Issei's eyes were closed as he was screaming and convulsing, his body glowing blue now. His underwear also caught on fire, revealing his semi-hairy crotch as well as his well-endowed prowess. He opened his eyes, with tears in them as he stared at Akino who was throwing thunderbolts at it. No! I can take this! Just... Let me do it! Issei said breathlessly, still screaming in pain. I won't let you die! Please stop this Issei! Akino begged. We can't Kuroka said. If we stop now the weapon will overload. Cyrus and his wife never finished it. It will overload and kill us all Kuroka said sadly. Ivy crossed her arms and just watched, slight concern in her eyes but her face looked indifferent. Issei continued convulsing as his body almost jolted into a position that wouldn't be possible. His bones ached from the movements, almost breaking at his elbows and knees but they held. After another five minutes of the pain, the machine stopped and the weapon powered down, glowing a very light blue as it was recharging. The chamber unsealed itself, and the door opened as the straps removed themselves. Issei fell to the ground in a lump and when Kuroka arrived, he was unconscious and barely breathing. You fucking idiot. Kuroka said, using her senjutsu to strengthen the life force of Issei, making sure he would survive. She also began scanning his body for any changes and she let out a small laugh. He did it. The idiot did it. His body has tripled in capacity. Capacity? Ivy asked, raising a brow. Issei's body is basically a giant battery. He held only a certain amount of electricity within his body and now, that capacity has tripled. He can hold much more of a charge. As well as that, he will be able to get stronger through physical exercise. Senjutsu won't improve ever for him, but he can learn more abilities more than likely. It was crazy but it worked. She said, gently picking up the team. Akino also helped her, both of them having won one of his arms around their shoulders as they dragged him off. Ivy pressed on and opened up the elevator, before assisting the two women into the elevator. Ivy then closed the elevator and sent it up to the main floor. She followed the women into his bedroom and watched as they laid the teen in his bed and covered his body with the sheet, letting him sleep. The two women and Ivy all left the bedroom, going downstairs and into the kitchen where Akino began making a new batch of tea. So, how did you meet Issei? Kuroka asked, staring at the newcomer. I came through a portal. Issei wasn't paying attention to where he was going, I called out to him, I attempted to him, and then we fought, and then here I am. Kuroka raised a brow and Akino looked behind her. You fought after trying to him? Might want to give us more of an explanation. Akino said, 
If I someone with this special tick, they obey any command I give them. They become my slaves for 24 hours in which I reapply. As for fighting, I tied him up in vines, attempted to force him into A, and he shocked my plants and held me done. We then talked and here I am. You attempted to turn Issei into a slave? Akino said, turning with thunder crackling in her hands. I did. Ivy said, not denying it. Kuroka sighed. And being the way he is, Issei has forgiven you and gave you a place in our house. Typical. She said with a small smile. Akino sighed. All right. It's in the past. However, if it happens again, you won't be able to hide from either of us. Ivy nodded. I know. This this world is so much different, much more powerful people here in this dimension. She said with a sigh. Not that I would do it if it was back in Gotham Issei is. Different? Quite. Akino said, chuckling. He's strange too. Just has different personalities that come up out of nowhere. I've noticed. Ivy said with a nod. So, can I bunk in the garden? She asked. Morning came rather quickly to Issei. For him, it only felt like five minutes but in actuality, over twelve hours passed since he did the experiment. It was six in the morning on Saturday, which means from this day, he has three weeks before his fight against Riser and his peerage. When he woke up, he immediately felt a surge of energy. Not like electricity, but like he just had so much energy to get up and start his day. He felt really good, and he had a huge smile on his face from the feeling. The smile increased as he noticed who was with him in his bed. Akino and Kuroka both were cuddling up to the male. Issei's happy grin turned into a one as Kuroka was completely while Akino wore just her see-through nightshirt. God I love boobs. He said. He had the urge to play with them, and he knew that he could cause they were his okay while well they were the but they let him play with them. They wouldn't mind but he pushed down the urge as he knew that he needed to focus on training. Plus if he really passed out, they were probably worried and stayed up late. They could sleep in. It took the teen about 10 minutes, but he wormed his way out of the hold. Yes, it took 10 minutes for him to figure out his plan of getting out, moving their arms and bodies and having to readjust when they moved them back. But out he came and he went downstairs, sliding down the railing. The staircase was a spiral one so he slid down a long way with a big smile on his face. It was a blast. He strolled into the kitchen, spotting Ivy who was awake and already making something to eat. Ivy heard someone enter, and she turned her head, spotting Issei. Well, looks like you are alright after your crazy stunt after all. Ivy said with a smirk. You got a death wish it seems. No. Just stubborn. Issei said, his eyes glued to the seductive green-skinned woman. Ivy was wearing pretty much nothing but a bra and panties which were green. They also had floral patterns on them. Ivy noticed his stare and smirked. Typical boy. She said, shaking her head in mirth. Eyes are up here Hayadu. Yeah but your legs and are below them. Issei said in a trance-like state only for his eyes to widen. He looked up into her eyes. I'm so sorry. Shit. I'm sorry. He said as Ivy was giving him a very cold stare. She then grinned and started laughing. Relax. I shouldn't expect anything different from someone your age. Plus you at least know you were doing something inappropriate. Yeah sorry. I like the bodies of women. Good to know that you like mine. Ivy said with a smirk. So what you think? Hmm honestly you are strange. The skin tone I've never seen someone have it. But considering I was attacked by vines I am assuming it's because of your affinity with plants. He said as he noticed her look. She seemed sad but Issei didn't falter. He continued. It's actually really nice. I think it's a beautiful shade of green and if you weren't that color, you wouldn't be you. Your legs are very well shaped but that's to be expected. You seem to enjoy using kicks as your close range fighting. Your legs are hot. We move up to your stomach and it looks like you have no body fat on you. You look like a supermodel. That's to be expected. I am a vegetarian. She said with a smile. You are really nice too. They are nice and round and perky and squishy and nice. He nodded. Then there is your face. It's just shaped so well. Then your eyes are a beautiful shake of light green. It's quite mesmerizing. He said with a nod. Ivy laughed behind a hand and nodded. You're an honest male. I respect that. Most men try to deny that they were being perverted and such. Honesty is very attractive. I don't like to lie if I can help it. I lie sometimes myself but I try not to. My father taught me it's best to be honest even if it gets you in trouble, or someone else in trouble. He said with a nod, respectable. So, about your garden. I am surprised. You don't take me as someone who enjoys gardening. Well, 
for the most part those plants out there are just for consumption. I have a few flowers that are there for decoration, but I do it to make the edible garden look better. If you come up to my room, I have several plant species you might like. Oh? Inviting this little oil lady up to your room already? Should I wear something comfortable? Ivy teased. Issei blushed and looked away before shaking his head. I'm training to be a chef, so the garden is great for making food here. Ivy nodded. That makes sense. You've really surprised me and I am glad that you did surprise me. So, what do you plan on doing today? Working out to get my body stronger while also working on my fighting skills. That will be for the first week. Next Saturday I will get into training my powers and trying to learn more skills and the week after that, I am well I don't know yet. I will see how I feel after the second week to see where I might need some improvement, but it's probably training my powers. I should let my body rest for three days before the fight. Ivy nodded. Well I might be able to help you get stronger. I'm a chemist, and I've created natural steroids without any side effects. I could attempt to see if I can make it within the next few days. That that would be great. You sure you aren't going to kill me? Ivy smirked. That's hurtful. Why would I hurt you? Considering you tried to make me into your slave, it's not far-fetched. He said with a huff. Fair enough, but what if I promise? She asked, giving him a puppy dog pout. Issei whimpered softly at the pout. Ivy looked so adorable at this moment. Oh all right. I will believe you, good boy. The seductive woman said. So how about that tour of your room? She asked with a wink. In another part of the world, Miami, Florida, a portal opened up in an alleyway. Out came a man with pale white skin, green hair, including his eyebrows, as well a red painting. With a giggle, he looked around. Oh ho ho. Seems like following little Pam worked like a charm. He he a new city. A new Gotham. A city without my sense of humor. Oh this shall be fun. He laughed and skipped off into the city. In Hawaii, another portal opened up alongside an erupting volcano. Lava flowed to the left and right of the portal, as it was on a pathway. Lucky pathway and portal. Out from the portal came a woman dressed in a jester uniform. It was checkered with red and black coloring. It also had tassels with white bulbs on the end. Geez red. Couldn't you wait another two minutes? She whined, looking around. Oh shit. She noticed the lava and quickly ran off, hoping to find some cover and hopefully, her girlfriend. Ivy followed Issei around the city. Issei had a large backpack on him and by the looks of his straining, it was ridiculously heavy. It probably didn't help he had large steel balls attached to his ankles that he was dragging through the town. She and Issei looked like quite the pair. First, there was the fact she's green in color but also wearing a normal outfit for her. She was wearing a skin-tight, almost leather-looking suit that stopped about four inches before her would end, so this meant a lot of cleavage showed. The suit was a one-piece, and it stopped basically an inch below her crotch so most of her leg was revealed. She was also wearing green gloves that went above a few inches below her shoulder. Her outfit was seaweed green. She was wearing a pair of seaweed green boots that was about six inches up from her ankles. Then there was Issei in a bright orange t-shirt, a pair of track shorts that were gray and a pair of hiking boots. Issei was also carrying a huge backpack and ankle weights. Very strange to see. So tell me about Gotham. Issei huffed and puffed. What exactly do you want to know? What did you leave there? He asked groaning. Ivy frowned at the question and looked up at the sky. My girlfriend. Harley Quinn was her name, and she's also another criminal like myself, but I loved her to pieces. I tried to get her to come with me but I couldn't reach her so I jumped through the portal without her. She said a tear going down her face. Issei stopped his moving and turned to look at Ivy. I see. That really sucks but perhaps she made it after all. Issei said, there has to be more people from Gotham that made it out, and I'm sure Harley read your message and found a portal. Maybe you should put up a wanted ad or something that posts that you are here in Japan but using code names. Like on Carrie's list. He said with a smile. I that's actually smart. When we get home we'll do that. I shall assist you. Issei said starting to move. Now what else can you tell me? You said you were a criminal right? What made you say you are a criminal? Did you have any enemies? Ivy sighed. You want hate me right? Don't know. Don't think so. I'm sure in your own way you had your reasons. Issei shrugged as they walked along the streets of Kuo. I hope I'm not making a mistake. The woman muttered before gently brushing some of her red hair from over her left eye. I am known as an eco-terrorist. I do things in order to save the environment. I've killed people by turning rich businessmen and women into trees. I've captured parks and murdered rapists, pedophiles and muggers. 
I increased plant life in these parks and even tried to do so in Gotham. Turning Gotham into a plant utopia, Issei raised a brow. A plant utopia? How I actually am curious on what that would be like. I never succeeded so I couldn't tell you, but I would destroy a lot of city buildings and create buildings out of plant material instead of steel. People would eat more plants and less processed foods. As much as I am a vegetarian, I wouldn't let people not eat meat either. Oh wow. That might be interesting to see but I am sad to tell you that this world wouldn't accept it either. In our world, people with powers are actually in secret. Not your world where powers seem to be in the open. In our world, we keep it a secret and if you don't you are generally put to death. I see. A pity. Not really. You can do whatever you want with my garden and my yard. Make it flourish. He said with a smile. So enemies? Ah. Uh, there was a man known as Batman in our world. A crime fighter. A lot of fancy tech and toys. He was the enemy of any villain in Gotham, but he wasn't the only enemy. There was also enemies like the Joker. He was a big villain who basically attempted to kill anyone, even villains. The Joker? What is he like? Sadistic. Vile disgusting. Harley my girlfriend used to be his girlfriend. He would beat the living shit out of her, and dump her outside I'd take care of her, and nurse her back to health only for her to run back and it would repeat itself. He has a pale white face, like makeup, green hair and blood red tick. So he looks like a clown. Well if he survived, I would kill him for you too. No hesitation? Simple. If the Joker gets here first, we don't want him just waiting and meeting Harley. So when Harley lands, she will instead sneak off and get to the movies. I see. Smart. I will try. Issei grinned. Thanks. Ivy said after two minutes of silence. Eh? For everything you've invited me into your home, and now you are helping me reunite with someone I care a lot for so thanks. Oh. Don't mention it. I have more than enough room here and I like to do good things. I can see that your girlfriends were right you really are a nice guy. I can see why women would fall for you. Issei sighed. Just because I'm nice? I don't get it but I won't argue with them. Women always win arguments. I'm aware. Issei grumbled. Well, until the movie, which is at 4 p.m., I will be training. Oh, actually I will be meeting her alone. I don't want you in any danger, just in case the Joker does show up. I will escort Harley here. Deal? Ivy frowned for a few moments before sighing. Yeah deal. I understand. Just bring her back safely okay? Will do. He said with a big smile before heading out for his daily training. Unknown to Issei, but he forgot something very important. A certain twin-tailed Woma. Issei had moved into the basement of the house, in the laboratory. The laboratory wasn't just where he was given more power. It had a wide open space for training. His father, apparently had used this place for his own training. Weight lifting equipment was stored, with a heavy coat of dust over most of it. Issei had some cleaning to do later. In the meantime, with a bright lead clock hanging on the ceiling, he was working out as he waited for the right time to go to the movie theater. He was laying on his back, with his feet being held down by a stationary bar on the ground. He was doing some sit-ups, grunting as he used his abs to lift his body up and then back down, up and down. He had arrived here shortly after talking with Ivy. The clock was reading 1.30 p.m., which meant he had about an hour and a half to kill before he made his move. He wanted to arrive early for his plan to work. He hoped that the plan would work anyway. If not, he'd improvise. Issei heard the elevator ding around 1.40, and out came Ivy who was eating an apple at this time. I want to come with. She spoke in between bites. No. Issei grunted, lifting himself up again and again and again. He put on a vest that had chains attached to the back, which would give him resistance as he would have to lift weights when he sat up in his workout. Two grunt. Dangerous. Grunt again. You don't understand the Joker is not just a clown. He's dangerous. Ivy retorted. Issei let out a loud grunt and sat up one last time before he laid down and undid the vest, his chest heaving from the strain. After about 10 seconds, the human looked over at Ivy. So what? I'm now in this life and danger will always be present. He can't be any more dangerous than you, right? I mean you control plants. The man is a mass murderer. He uses a chemical that is mixed with his own blood. It forces the victim to laugh to death. Their lungs stop working as they can't breathe. Then their faces turn into a permanent smile. I see and you think this is more dangerous than someone who can probably call a giant killer Venus fly trap that can engulf a building, let alone a person? I'm not buying it. Does he have any superpowers or is he just homicidal? He has a lot of toys killer toys. 
They look kid-friendly, but they aren't. Please, I believe you Ivy, but I can't have him hurt you. Why are you so concerned for my safety? Ivy asked with a slender eyebrow raised. Why can't I be worried over my friends? You and Harley are going to end up living here for the time being, are you not? So, while you are under my roof, you are my family. I will take care of my family. I'm not weak and I don't need your protection. I never said you were weak, but it doesn't mean I can't protect you. Why are you so concerned over me going on my own? Are you worried I won't get Harley? That's part of it, but what if you are wrong and you fail? You need to have some faith in me. Faith goes a long way. Issei said with a smile. But if you really want to go, I'll have to fix my plan to include you. What is your plan? Issei smirked and filled her. At first, she frowned at him and scowled. But as he continued to explain his plan and how it would go, the frown slowly turned into a smirk, and she found herself seeing just how devious Issei could be. The clock struck 3.20 and Issei finished two more reps with the weights before placing them back onto the holder. He sat up and reached for his water bottle, only for the lightly green-skinned woman to hand him the bottle. She was his spotter, standing above his head while he worked. So, do you feel any stronger? Ivy asked Issei as he continued to down the bottle of water. Issei shrugged and brought his right hand up, letting his electricity arc between his fingers. No, but I don't feel so full either. I don't feel stronger nor weaker. But I feel like the plug on my power has been removed and I can finally expand. Just have to keep working on it. What do you think you can do to get stronger? Ivy asked as Issei would quickly step into the laboratory shower, which didn't have any glass or anything. Issei just stripped before Ivy and showered quickly, just to clean the sweat off. He didn't use any soap, as it was just a rinse, before he got dressed and placed a cool towel around his neck. Issei shrugged. I'm not sure. I need to practice more of my hand-to-hand -hand skills, as well as more senjutsu which is the art of ki, with Kuroka. I need to think of new ways to use my electricity. My body is already storing more energy than before, but all it does currently is let my fight longer before recharging. I need to find a way to increase the power of the electricity already stored, but I am unsure right now. I'll find a way, but I should be enough to fight the phoenix. Phoenix? Riser Phoenix is the guy who is trying to marry the woman I'm trying to save. He has the power to regenerate any damage he takes so it'll be tough but that's why my hand-to-hand -hand skills will come in handy to keep him away. I need to up my reflexes especially. I have three weeks from this day to train. I want to spend two weeks, maybe two and a half just working on my hand-to-hand -hand and senjutsu. Senjutsu I can train at night before bed, as it's not as exhausting as physical training. I think it's better you do physical every other day, so your body can repair the damaged muscle to strengthen it. It's why you don't work on the same muscles twice in a row. If you are just sparing, you can probably get away with two in a row, maybe three. But I advise against more than that. What is the nature of your fight? Peerage against peerage. It'll be Kuroka, Akino and I versus Riser and like 15 more devils. Hmm. So you are at a disadvantage with numbers. How do you plan on winning? Superior skill and firepower. Kuroka is one of the strongest devils SS class. Class systems? Interesting so she's super powerful. What about Akino? She's a fallen angel, and she should be able to use light but I think she just uses thunder for some reason. I won't ask, but she is good with spells and can lay traps and illusions. Kuroka can do the same, but she and I will be a fence, Issei said as they boarded the elevator to head to the ground floor. I don't know the rules of the game though I should probably get some information. He snorted. First things first, we need to get Harley. Ivy said and Issei nodded. Indeed. Stay out of sight while I handle the Joker and get Harley safe. No! Ivy scolded. You get the Joker and I will get Harley. That's too dangerous. Not allowing it. You cannot forbid me from helping here. I just did. You are forbidden. Issei nodded. Ivy glared at Issei and her hand twitched, as if aching to smack him, but she noticed the subtle smirk on his face. Once again, this teenager was getting the best of Ivy. Poison Ivy! Men didn't get the upper hand in teasing her. She was the one who did it. With a huff, Ivy just shook her head and left the house with Issei in tow. Which is ironic cause Issei was the one who knew where to go. Not her. It took them about 10 minutes to reach the theater, and the bank's clock said it was 3.45. Issei was in the alleyway to the left of the theater, should you be facing it. He was putting on a dirty and ripped up cloak, as well as putting a hunch into his back. He moved out of the alleyway and took a seat at the corner of the building, a large cardboard box that looked very lived in to his left. He held out a cup and started to shake it. He had put in two quarters to make a jingly sound. He had no shoes on, 
but actual newspaper wrapped around his feet. Ivy had entered the theater through the pack, sneaking past a few of the workers and entered the movie. She quickly scanned the room, as it was empty. She quickly moved through the theater, looking up and down the rows. She let out a sigh of relief. The Joker was not waiting for Harley. The Joker was smart, but she never knew what he would plan. As soon as the time struck 3.55, right on schedule a blonde woman with her hair and pigtails moved out of a different alleyway across the street. She was wearing a red and black costume, but her hood was down, so she didn't look exactly what Ivy had said, but it was good enough. He said the woman entered the theater and waited. His eyes scanned the busy street, looking for any sign of trouble. His eyes spotted a man in a light trench coat and a large hat covering his eyes. It was too easy to see that this person didn't want to be spotted. Issei kept staring at the man through the corner of his eyes, spotting the maniacal grin and the pale cheeks and chin. It was still going according to plan. Issei quickly took out his phone, sending a text message to Ivy. Issei had picked up a throwaway phone for Ivy on their way here. He's here. Get Harley out of there and quietly, but quickly, move out the back. The way you came in. I'll be there waiting, he sent, before putting the phone away and moving into alleyway to await his prey. He moved his box into the alleyway and moved into the cardboard box. Cyrus had taught Issei the value of patience and planning, yet action as well. Sometimes, charging in head first was the right strategy. But sometimes you want to plan out your actions. This was one of those times, if anything was to be believed by Ivy, which Issei had no reason to call her a liar. Ivy was waiting in the theater on the far side, closest to the exit of the particular screen she was in. She didn't have to wait long, as five minutes of waiting, and a minute after the text, Harley appeared. She spotted Ivy and started to run. Her mouth opened but the signal of shush by Ivy was spotted and Harley knew something was up. Harley made her way to Ivy quickly and whispered, Red, it's your here. She spoke quietly. Ivy nodded. Sit down and wait for the right moment. You'll know it when it happens. When it does, follow me, Ivy said, moving to lean against the wall on the other side of the seats, out of sight. She only hoped that the Joker did not come through this way. Luck was on her side as Harley yelped and stuttered. And Mr. Jay, what are you doing here? Harley squealed, her voice frantic. Oh, Harleen, what's with that tone? Haven't you missed your dear old Uncle Jay? The maniacal clown said. Harley immediately leapt over the wall, chasing after Ivy who was waiting at the door. Ivy nodded at her and started running, Harley giving chase. Ha 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 ha! Oh Harley, let me rev up that motor! The clown called after her as he also gave chase. After two minutes later, Harley and Ivy exited through a door and came out into the sunshine. Red! What are we going to do? He's here, Harley baby. It's okay, how will it be okay? It's the Joker. I know Mr. J. The Joker teased, coming through the door. He shed his cloak and grinned. Hello Pammy Whammy. We're all back together, the family. Come and give me a hug, he said with a laugh. Go to hell clown. Ivy snarled. Issei was nearby and quickly summoned his senjutsu as soon as he heard all three voices here. He expanded the senjutsu and put up a barrier. TSK TSK that's not very nice. I think this plant needs a bit of trimming how about a few feet off the top? He laughed before pulling out a pair of hedge clippers. He pressed the on and it sparked with electricity. As soon as the joker lunged, a bolt of electricity shot out and grabbed onto the hedge clippers. With a yank, Issei tugged the clippers, spun around and swung the hedge clippers into the clown's face. Smashing into his face with the plastic part, the joker flew and slammed into the nearby wall as Issei removed the cloak and his newspaper shoes, stepping into his own shoes. That's not very nice of you, trying to do that. TSK TSK. It wasn't even funny, not funny boy. The Joker snarled. I'll show you something funny. The Joker said, pulling out a single Joker's card. He then threw it at Issei who bent backwards to the left. He reached out and grabbed onto the card, before throwing it back at the Joker, who took the razor sharp card in the chest. You child I'm going to enjoy making a light bulb out of you. The Joker snarled. Issei rolled his eyes as the electricity started to arc over him. Do you know the difference in temperature of a crematory oven and lightning? No? Well, it's about 49,000 degrees, Issei said, shooting out a large bolt of lightning from both hands, as he extended them both out at the Joker. Before he could even respond, the clown was struck in the chest as the lightning bolts continually heated up the Joker's body. Here's an interesting factoid. The surface of the sun is roughly 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit give or take. Lightning can reach up to 50,000 give or take. 
So this is five times the heat, he roared, not that it mattered. Issei shot so much power at the Joker, that the lightning actually burned a hole through the clown's chest. Issei noticed this and stopped his power, only to send another condensed bolt of lightning through the clown's head, placing a big hole where his nose, eyes, and mouth should be. Issei moved over to the fuse box of the theater, and quickly started to drain the power, to recharge himself. After 20 seconds, Issei took a deep breath and stopped arcing the electricity through his body, going back to normal. You two okay? Issei asked, breathing deeply to calm his heart. Yes. Issei thank you, Ivy said, as she was holding on to her girlfriend. Said girlfriend was staring at the dead body of the Joker, her eyes wide. Did Red? What just happened? I arrived here a day ahead of you Harley I think well I've been with Issei Hayata here and I told him about the Joker. Issei volunteered to remove him, and the Joker is no more. The Joker can no longer haunt you or I Ivy said, cuddling the woman. Harley stared at the body for a few seconds before she turned her attention to Issei who had finally turned around and was staring at the pair. Harley's eyes quickly lowered, wandering over the body of the teenager. He's a kid Harley quipped. Issei narrowed his eyes. I am not a kid. I'm close enough to an adult my birthday is coming up anyway old fart. He huffed out, only to smirk at the end. Harley narrowed her eyes. Whatever you say baby boy, she said smugly, before turning to Ivy. What are we going to do now, Red? We're staying with Issei for the time being. We're in a new dimension. Oh no. I don't think I want this old fart stinking up my house. Issei said, placing his hands into his light jacket. I suppose I could find her a retirement home nearby. Issei continued. Look pal, Ivy is my girlfriend and where she goes, I go. Harley replied. Is she normally this clueless when someone is screwing with her? Issei said with a snicker. Hey. I am not clueless. I am just innocent. The snort that came from Ivy said that was a lie. Yeah well, you can bunk with Ivy in the garden. But I want a bead. She whined, stomping her feet. Stop being such a child. Ivy said, playfully smacking her on the arm. I should have a room available. Issei said with a shrug. Let's go home. Issei said, expanding the barrier a bit more and leaving the alley. After they left the barrier, he took it down, leaving the body of the Joker to rot until someone found it. Issei was about four yards ahead of the two lovebirds. Issei had finished telling Harley a bit more about this world, and she realized she found herself in a very strange dimension, one where she doesn't even rank as much as she did back in Gotham. She was very much alone with Ivy. He is kind of cute. Harley whispered to Ivy. Issei was out of earshot. While he did have powers, his was still human. Ivy gave a pointed stare to Harley. What? He is. Tell me you haven't noticed his body. What are you thinking about Harley? She whispered with a note of warning in her voice. I'm just saying, am I not good enough any more of you Harley? Is that what this is about? Do you just want to get him in the sack? I'm just saying that I don't know this world very well. We don't know this world. We could use his guidance, and if it leads to some physical fun, what harm could be in that? He has two girlfriends already Harley, and both are very protective over him. Ivy commented. Though if they went that far to share him they probably share him with others. She continued, If you are upset you can tell me Red. You can tell me everything. Harley said. Ivy just shrugged. I'm not upset. Just very much confused why you seem to dislike him in the alley and now you want to jump him. Harley smiled and shrugged. A girl can change her mind. Harley giggled. Ivy rolled her eyes, but smiled as she hugged the blonde woman closer to her side. Their life have started anew this time in Qua. Thanks for watching this video. If you really enjoy this video, like subscribe and comment down below and turn on that bell notification. Don't forget to support and follow the ex Doug Dimidomex for writing that awesome fanfic and also make sure to comment on this story link in the description. See you in the next video. Goodbye.